Something in this room is electric. I mean, the fisherman is laid on the hall. Well, There's the lightning. the lightning. Wow, what did I just witness? Well, there it is. Lucas wins game number one by 85 HP. He waves the white flag, and Morton's going to go two up. Oh, my word. The unthinkable has happened. Free Rocket not needed. Air Surfer wins this one in three. You need the NATO. Where is the the craziest comeback I've ever seen. I was so excited behind the scenes. It was a wild one, and we are not done yet. Nova, Liquid, Queso, Mugi, who will be the next to join our illustrious group of world champions and engrave their name in Clash Royale history? Hello and welcome to day two. I am Andrew Guy, and day one was nothing short of breathtaking. We saw confidence translate into dominance, a two HP, three crown finish, and our current reigning world champion showing us he hasn't lost a step. But for four of our competitors, the road has already come to an end. And for four more, they find themselves clinging to hopes of world champion, including fan favorite, Mohammed Light. By the end of today, we will give away 200,000 more dollars, say goodbye to half of our competitors, and be left with the final six for our final day. Day two of the Clash Royale League World Finals starts now! Thank you, Andrew, for kicking us off. I'm Rich Slayton, that's Joshua A.C. Sharon, two-time Regional Clash Royale League champion. If you're checking your notes, and this is day two of our Clash Royale League World Finals. We are in the second phase, meaning eliminations happening all throughout the day. Yeah, and you do not want to be there. We have our four still perfect, and that's what we want to be seeing. 16 players started off in a double elimination bracket. Of course, four of those left yesterday. We're doing BO3 matches using the dual format, meaning you may not repeat cards throughout this event. You play Hog Rider game one, no Hog in game two, no Hog in game three. And of course, we're gonna work our way until there is one player, one person, one champion named for this Clash Royale League. 2022 season. Josh, they aren't just playing for that crown, for that glory. There's also a lot of money on the line. That's right. Who wants to play for free? Luckily, that is not what is going to happen today. $250,000 going to first place, $125,000 per second, 80, 65, four, third, and fourth, 50,000, 40,000, 30,000, and 20,000 already locked up to the first four competitors that were knocked out yesterday. And of course, all 12 remaining right now have taken home $30,000 already. And each match, the stakes get higher and higher. With that in mind, let's check in on our bracket. As we look at the upper side of things, we have some gargantuan matchups in round two of the winner's bracket. Kicking things off, it's Sandbox up against the enigmatic Sweep. Then a battle of former friends turned enemies, Lucas X Gamer against Samuel Basoto. And then Josh, match 15. <laughs> we get this on day two, two of the all-time greats in Morton and Moogie. Morton and Moogie going against each other, the battle of the composed against the skilled. I cannot wait to see, and I mean, okay, both of them are skilled, both of them are composed. We've seen that from day number one. We've seen that from their careers. Let's go take a look at how the casters came together on their predictions for this one. Of course, uh, Juicy J looked like he had the best results yesterday. Today, we are all over the place. Three of us picking sweep, only one picking sandbox, maybe a bit of a live underdog in that one. Lucas, three to one lead on Samuel Basoto. And then look at this, the desk picking Morton, except for my guy right here, going with his roommate, the God RF, picking <laughs> Moogie. And then in that last match, three for Air Surfer and sweep the lone one picking KK. Of course, that might be one of the tightest matches of the day, KK versus Air Surfer. Yeah, absolutely. Air Surfer put on a show and you have to give credit to KK. I mean, taking out who he took out, no one saw it coming except him, except a lot of the fans actually, because he is one of those fan favorites. Well, to get things kicked off, let's jump right in. Andrew Guy, give us our first match. 
while they have two incredibly different play styles, they both found success on day one, giving them a birth on day two and securing $30,000. Welcome, Sandbox and Birthday Boy Sweep! That is right, a very happy birthday to Sweet, but of course Sandbox looking to give him the worst gift of all, and that's a trip away from our World Finals. And Andrew did say it really well. This is two players with very, very different play styles. You have Sweep on one side, who might be the most unpredictable person here at this World Finals, whereas Sandbox is one of the best live deck pickers in the entire tournament. Yeah, and I mean, just look at that win rate, 92%. You have to be so excellent in every single facet of the game. That, uh, you know, we, we've talked about Sandbox's skill with Cycle and with Beatdown. Nobody else can really, you know, juggle the two win, uh, you know, the win styles like he can. These two players have already met this season, and it was Sandbox coming out on top in that matchup, running Royal Giant, Archer Queen, and then Pigs recruits the Fireball Bait variation against Sweep on the other side of things. Man, you look at, uh, at what Sweep has done in that one. Uh, he did his best hang in, but it was Sandbox who came out on top. Yeah, and right now, I do think that without live experience, Sandbox would have the advantage, but Sweep, he, he's just so special when he's on the stage. Well, prognostication is just that. It doesn't give us results. Let's get our first one going down to the floor for our first match, Sandbox and Sweep. Very curious to see what Sweep opens with here in this matchup. He usually saves either Graveyard or Royal Giant for game number three. Those are his two go-tos in the final stanza. Of course, in a situation like this, maybe you go with the go-to early on. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure those are the first recruits of the World Finals. Correct me if I'm wrong. I, I know I don't have the data right in front of me, but certainly I'll be happy to have those. And this matchup with Mighty Miner on the board. Yeah, when he pops that ability, Whoa. it's all you see. I, okay, the mortar will be able to pull, and I think he should be fine with this. We do see him nod his head, so that's always a good sign when you are the player defending. The Royal Recruit does get it down low, but the Musketeer, what a strong, strong card, able to take out the Bloom before it hits the tower. When's the last time you saw six Loon, Josh? It has not been played much as of late. Balloon, in particular, not very popular at the moment, and six Loon, kind of a couple metas ago. That's right. I do wonder if he is going to go with the Lumberjack in that six Loon, or if we're going to see the addition of Champions. I really feel like it's just been so long that I don't even know if Champions were released. There we go. We do see the Lumberjack in this deck, and I'm just really wondering what that last card will be. Definitely high possibility of a spell of some sort. Currently only running Snowball is the Canadian Sweep, who, of course, is making a return World Finals appearance after that phenomenal run for Pain Gaming in 2020 where they took out Nova and made it to the top four. With one minute and 10 seconds left, Mighty Miner cycled in the back once again, just trying to wait to pop its ability. We do see it take out the first shield, and I think that's really gonna be the style that he chooses uh, to use that Mighty Miner. It's going to be tower plus shield taken off, and then he pops that ability every single time. AQ to meet the Mighty Miner. We'll do a little bit of work on the Musketeer as well. Goes into the ability. Gonna take one shot, 26-10 on the right-hand side. Currently, Sandbox with the lead sweep in it, though. I love that he's going with the Mortar on the right side in that specific angle. That means he can use the Musketeer on the left, and then it will be able to help out if the Balloon crosses in time. It's kind of in an okay spot, and Whoa. that is a great uh, snowball back. Musketeer not going to help out on, on that Loon, but Sandbox is just going to respond with another Musketeer. Doesn't even matter. Now two Muskies to the left-hand side. So he's going to go Fisherman to deal with those. And the Poison to get the Fisherman off this Musketeer caught by the Recruits. Mighty Miner in the middle. And we do see the guards in the middle as well. No ability pop just yet. We see it. Ability plus delivery plus everything is going to be able to knock this out right now. But the Archer Queen will be able to survive 
full health across the bridge. In sudden death overtime, things have not changed much. Sandbox adding little bits of chip to that lead sweep. Needs to find a way through, and Josh looking at Mortar, Ice Spirit, Musketeer, and of course that Poison, it feels like that's gonna be a tall order. It is, but that's the thing with these Lumber Loon decks, and that's why it's so enjoyable to cast these matches. You have so many different opportunities. No other deck in the game allows you to get that aggressive, have that many opportunities on top of the tower. Guards doing a great job protecting that Musketeer. Sticks a shot, but still alive. Now Offensive Mortar out from Sandbox. Does not target tower, and the recruits do come up in time. So this is so far been a slow, methodical, very intelligent battle on both sides. Yeah, right here, Musketeer is cycled to the left side. We do see the Lumberjack at the bridge. Loon will follow closely behind. Rage plus Balloon not even going to be that dangerous. Sandbox has set himself up beautifully every single time. And look at that wow. ability be used. Pushes it into the Musketeer. What a play. Here we are in Triple Elixir. Josh, what does Sweep have to do to break through here? I don't know, that's the thing. Sandbox is cycling so perfectly. Cycling the Mortars, cycling the Musketeers, protecting the Musketeers. No offensive big spell has allowed him to defend easily. I think he's doing everything that he can, maybe try, and this is it. I couldn't think of it, but that's why he's the pro. Sweep going in with the Loon in the back behind the Crown Tower. I love that play. And recruits do protect here. Musketeer out of the way. Back to a second Mortar will be very simple here for Sandbox, should be in hand now. Musketeer plus Ice Spirit looking to work. Second Loon down and the Mortar up high. And those Mortars could, I believe, chain that Balloon. And this looks like it's going to be a GG well played. Unless something crazy happens in 12 seconds, Sandbox is secure game number one. This was domination from the start and Sweep did nothing wrong. That's the thing. When you run these kind of decks, sometimes you can play a perfect match. Not going to matter. Sandbox going to take the win in spectacular fashion. Yeah, that was just perfect Clash Royale from Sandbox. Never got caught flat-footed, never overspent. Recognized the matchup very early and planned everything out with perfection. This is, a, I, I was able to say it yesterday, and I said it about Sandbox as well. That was slightly boring to watch. He just played everything right. No mistakes whatsoever. Cycling perfectly, cycling perfectly, cycling perfectly. Game over. I love seeing that in Clash Royale. And that's the most funny thing. You know, you talk about this game at this level. What you want to see really yes. is a boring game yes. in a lot of cases. Yes. And that's what it was. It was just cool, calm, collected. Sandbox absolutely shutting things down. I just loved how he used those Musketeers throughout the game. And just the Mighty Miner as well. He was using it perfectly on top of the recruits, but then he had that one play. That that play where he pushed the Loon into the middle even more than it was originally going to go. Like, Sweep was trying to use his offensive snowballs to push the Musketeer out, and it wasn't mattering just because of how Sandbox was using his cards. The control was very nice. Let's look at how you picked for this matchup. Did you pick Sandbox or did you pick Sweep? Of course, most of us picking Sweet may be feeling that he had the mojo and Sandbox certainly nervous yesterday. We saw his hand shaking on the tower a little bit, but maybe that one game was all he needed to get rid of those nerves. Yeah, actually, so I was doing a little bit of research in these original matchups. I have Sandbox rated the highest out of any of these four players. I gave him a score of 27 out of 10, meaning all of his games played, it, 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 he had an average of a 9 out of 10 skill rating on how he played the matchup. Well, Sandbox, 65 to 35. If you go with uh, with Josh's how you rate things, that's like a 7,000 to a 27. I don't really know. You'll have to do that math for me one more yeah, time yeah, yeah. of how you rate more than 10 out yes. of 10. But you know what? I oh, support did I say 27 out of 10? He said 27 out of 10. 27 out of 30. There each, 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 <laughs> each match is 10 full points. That's on me. That's on me. Won't happen again. Okay, 27 out of 30. But of course, you picked 65, 35 in favor of Sandbox. We just saw almost 100-0 in terms of matchup. Yeah, that's right. It's, but that's the thing. It's only 100-0 when you play it that way. Yeah. It, 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 I, I don't know how he played it that way. It was, it was fun to watch. Absolute brilliance. Let's go ahead and see what happens in game number two right now. Yesterday it was Sweep with the really compelling theory crafting late in the game with Zappies and Fisherman both out. Went for the E-Giant Mini P.E.K.K.A. EQ deck and got a very nice win over Arden. Of course, less information here in game number two than in that game three, but let's see if Sweep has something else compelling to pull out now. 
Sandbox could be going back to his RG deck, and we do see him wince in pain. That is not what he wanted to see. The Mega Minion must have a good matchup over most oh, of his cards. And what? we see the Sparky come look out. At, so look laughing. at Sandbox's, I mean, look at Sweep's face, man. <laughs> Both of them kind of laughed here. And, you know, you don't expect to see a lot of Sparky at World Finals, but that is the difference in duels, right? The more information you get over time, and, you know, we've seen Sweet play stuff like Giant Bowler, GY. He's willing to go, and it's Giant GY Sparky. If this were anywhere else, I would say, what in the world are you doing? But at World Finals, with the information we have, we got to think Sweep has something in mind. There we go, but Sandbox still, I mean, what a defense right there. Defending it perfectly, he will be oh able my to word. have. Look at the right-hand right tower. Right -hand tower, A65, only three elixir for sweep. Sandbox in a prime position to take a 2-0 set victory. Zappies and, of course, the Skeleton King and that Tombstone, three really important pieces. Going to be really hard, I think, for Sweep to find some way, especially without NATO, unless he's somehow running NATO in this nonsense. Unless he has a NATO, I don't know how he finds a way past all those troops to make this, the Sparky shoot. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And Sandbox, his earlier play of going Skeleton King to the right side, I was kind of wondering what the reason for that was. And then we saw it right there. If he has enough elixir going down the field, Sweep can't go all in if Sandbox can properly defend. Just brilliant right there. And we see the fireball cycled on top. He knows how to play this matchup. He's going to be able to get to a second fireball if necessary. The opposite lane pressure, very, very impactful here. Sandbox just needs to play defense and then throw a fireball. And now it's the mini P.E.K.K.A. Giant push to the opposite lane. The Skeleton King does take a very important shot. Can this E-Wiz mitigate the damage enough on its own to allow for a big push in the right-hand lane? Right there, the Fisherman will be able to pull the Giant in a great position right there. Tombstone will be able to go into the middle if he chooses to do so. Fisherman gets the correct yank, but the E-Wiz zaps it off. So if he will be able to make it to the tower, I just don't see it doing enough damage. Giant doing a whole lot. Arrows in. Skeleton's putting in some real significant work. Sandbox zaps the right-hand tower out of safety and secures the win, secures the match. Sandbox moving on to the next, right, next round of the winner's bracket. That was a brilliant gameplay this entire set. We see him celebrate on top of the stage. A well-deserved victory. That, that couldn't have been played better. That was a perfect set for our game number or our set number one. Yeah, that was just absolute brilliance from Sandbox top to bottom. Didn't get caught flat-footed. Sweep doing what Sweep does, going with some strange stuff. It kind of feels like he had a clear game plan for game one and game two coming out with such insane stuff, but Sandbox able to stay in the pocket and not get shook by it. Let's go ahead and find out what he was expecting maybe and how he feels after that game number one. Sandbox, congratulations. With that win, you just secured $50,000. How does it feel? He wants to return to Korea and have a great time with his family. Well, and Sandbox, you are now in farther and farther. How do you feel about your next opponent? Well, it's the way. Never mind. All right, back to you guys on the desk. That was my bad. <laughs> Well, you know what? Either way, he's going to have another tough outing after this one as he'll be facing the winner of our next match. We'll get more on that one in just a minute. But, Josh, this was this was what we expected from a sweep, wild decks. But, again, sometimes we talked about this during the last episode of Three Crowns. Sweep has a tendency to take big swings, but big swings sometimes leave your chin high in the air. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look into deck number one, I mean, I love what Sweep came out with. I think it does... It, it, it approaches the game differently than a lot of those other crazy decks. You know, the Sparky and the difference between a Sparky and a Lumber Loon, it's going to have a lot more pressure. You can do all sorts of things. You have an early defense. I mean, we saw what happened in Argentoas' game three. An early start can just win you the game right there. Sandbox's defense, Musketeer, delivery, uh, Mighty Miner activation of its ability, and the Mortar, he couldn't get past it. Well, the big question here as we go into deck number two is, these two decks are both wild, both out there, but they both feel almost like, I mean, the first one used to be meta. This one, certainly not meta. <laughs> they both feel like game three decks rather than game one decks. It kind of feels like yesterday he went with meta early and then theory crafted in game three, whereas this time he just came out swinging right out the gate. Yeah, that's right. And I especially love that call just with deck number two. When we look at it, it 
doesn't really do well against anything. You, you, you don't look at it and say, oh, that's going to match up well against Hog. Because if you go against Hog, I mean, yes, you have the mini P.E.K.K.A., but then he fireball cycles, has so many opportunities. You see Earthquake cycles and Archer Queen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I, I really don't like that for a game one and game two. Well, it was both games for Sandbox, who put together a master class performance. A lot of you might look at those decks and go, oh my gosh, panic, panic, panic. But that's what a pro does, takes in the information, starts off slow, and then of course gathers that for a proper read on things overall. And of course, there was some interesting moments here and to help us out, breaking some of those down, we've got Jackson, Juicy J Wall. Juicy, this was a strange match overall. Uh, you of course know Sweep very well. And uh, this is one where it feels like Sandbox was just playing reactive Clash Royale. Absolutely. I think that Sweep is really trying to maybe snipe the more solid Sandbox RG, not the Mother Witch, Skelly King RG. He had a lot of single targeting units like the Mini P.E.K.K.A. We didn't have a good way to deal with all of those units. And I yeah, just wasn't able to hit that snipe. And I just think he was overall over aggressive. Let's hop into this Telestration if we can. All right. So he played Sparking back. He went for the Giant. At this point, it's really aggressive to go with the Graveyard here. I think at this point he should be going for only this giant Sparky push, maybe supporting it by going for this Graveyard. Even though the Mother Witch is out of cycle, the defense on Sandbox's end with these Zappies and the Bar Barrel, where Sweep doesn't have enough Elixir to counter those units, as well as defend the Skeleton King. It just was over aggressive. You can see Sandbox's celebration here. You know, Sweep just not having the correct um, splash units to deal with that Skeleton King and over aggression. And at this point, the game's lost. And yeah, you make a very good point here. This was still early in single elixir. I mean, when we see that Skeleton King on the right-hand side, barely a minute of gameplay has passed. This seems like a deck that would have been maybe a bit more frustrating to deal with in double and triple. Absolutely, yeah. You go Sparky and back, you do get the value. Like I said, maybe go for a giant, support it with a Mega Minion. Save a decent amount of elixir for that push on the right, at least a Mini P.E.K.K.A. or a Mega Minion on top of that. And then maybe you sort of save that graveyard for a surprise factor, like you said, in the Triple Elixir. Well, after a very quick match number one, we are ready for match number two. Andrew Guy, take it away. While they both represent Brazil, old friends have become new enemies in our competitive scene. Please welcome Lucas X Gamer and Samuel Basoto. This is one of the more compelling matchups on paper here, Josh. You know both these guys very well. Your former teammate, Samuel Basoto, and of course, Lucas, one of the top five players on the planet. And again, as it's been mentioned, both formerly very, very close, had a bit of a falling out as of late. And I wonder how that impacts the gameplay on stage. Yeah, Samuel, uh, yesterday on Twitter, he was talking about Doom. So he, he, he keeps getting these matchups where he's going against rivals. He's going against these people that he really wants to beat. It's always interesting. It's always amazing in Clash Royale when we have that storyline right here. Two ex great friends, now bitter rivals. And you talk about play style. Both of these guys are known for being top tier, fast cycle players. Do you imagine either one of these guys going away from that? Are they going to go, hey, I want to play, the, I want to outplay you today on this stage? I, I, and that's the thing. That's why I love these kind of matchups because we could easily see that happening. That's what I want to say. I'm, I'm not going to say what I predict will happen. I'm going to say what I want to happen. I want to see two mirror matchups in game one, just a mirror matchup game one, game two, and game three. I want them to talk before the broadcast, before the show, and say, these are the three decks we're running. And that is one of those big stunts. You come out there and you say, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you what I'm going to do. You give me what you're going to do. We'll see who's the best player on the planet. Mirror matches, as you mentioned, that does change things a lot because now some people say it's the most competitive. Some say it's more about knowing how to play that specific mirror matchup. Yeah, and actually, if you would have asked me two days ago, I would have said, ah, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it can be a cycle, it can be whatever. Oh, but I forgot who it was. Oh, I was so excited. Somebody yesterday, I'm going to look back at the tape. I'll, I'll come back on the broadcast in, you know, 30 minutes, whatever it is. But they played the mirror match so brilliantly that it changed my mind completely on it. Yeah, I mean, it certainly can happen. Of course, a lot of that is knowing what the key <laughs> cards are for that mirror match, what you protect, what you don't protect, where you have to cycle first. But of course, talking about mirror matches is to the side. We don't even know if we have one yet, but we 
do know we have right now is Lucas and Samwell. And you talk about the history of these two players, of course, both very similar in age. Samwell Basoto joined you, of course, in CRL for a short time and helped you guys win that Clash Royale League Western Championship mm. in the spring of 2020. On the other side of that, Lucas came up as a hog player, was known at one point as one of the top 2.6 hog cycle players on the planet, and of course has moved a lot even in 2020, starting off his campaign with Pain Gaming, not being the greatest head-to-head -head player despite expectations, moved over to 2v2, and that completely changed the fates of Pain Gaming. And right here, we do take a look at the predictions. I think it was 51% Lucas, 49% Basoto. That feels right. I, that feels absolutely correct. I think I think there's a little error, though. I think it should have said 50-50. Yeah, 50-50 might have been more on the nose. And of course, we're going to go ahead and waste no more time. Let's jump right in and see who comes out on top, Lucas X Gamer or Samuel Basoto. And I'm just gonna let you guys sit with this one for a moment. As you can feel the tension in the room, the crowd has gotten to a murmur. And Samwell going out with the Ice Spirit and Skeletons. And looking like Piggy's EQ, Bowler out for Lucas. Bowler plus Golden Knight. It could be a weird drill, could be a loon, could be a graveyard. Probably gonna be one of those three. Basoto going in with the quick cycle. That's exactly what we want to see from, and, you know, we're getting it from one of these players. I feel like we've seen a lot more Bomb Tower this weekend already than I anticipated. Yeah, that's right. And I really want to know what the reasoning is for that. I don't think, I, I, I guess Giant Skeleton and Mirror? did something that uh, the Bomb Tower couldn't handle, and now it's uh, back in full form. And so it is a freeze deck, and Lucas getting rid of that surprise early on. Of course, Bowler does make freeze exceptionally likely by comparison to a lot of other cards in the deck, but now, what does he have for these piggies? It's gonna be the Zappies. And we could see the Earthquake log. We do see the Earthquake and the log missed. No, okay, so we got one of the uh, piggies to the King Tower, but look at that damage down to 1409. This could be a situation where we see log EQ cycle for the rest of the game, mixing in just one or two Royal Hawks. First 90 seconds away, and it is Samuel with a clean sheet so far, 30-52 on both towers. Luke is taking the brunt of the damage. Significant damage now on that left-hand side. And, you know, big question here, Josh. We don't talk about leaked elixir a whole lot, but you see 5.4 already leaked by Lucas, and that's the difference between the, you know, a little bit less than difference between those hogs. You gotta wonder if maybe some slow decision-making there as he wanted to know what to do with the queen, put him in a bit of a hole. Yeah, that's right. It's just so awkward for him. Almost every single time he plays any card, Samuel Basoto is going to have a good answer for it. We do see the log with the Royal Hogs freeze on defense. So that's seven elixir, but Lucas is playing eight elixir on defense, and we're still going to see the Archer Queen get plenty of plenty of value and a great Ice Spirit right there going to allow him to take out most of the Baby Dragon. And look at Samuel taking advantage of that Elixir to get the EQ cycle in early. 10.05 on the left-hand tower, and still Samuel Basoto has not given up any damage on either tower. Right here, this is Lucas's big push up to 10 Elixir. What is he gonna place in front? It's not the Loon, it is going to be the Graveyard. Will he try to protect it before it crosses the bridge? We are gonna see the Golden Knight get what the dash. dash, almost dashes on everything. And we need to see a Bomb Tower right there. Ice Spirit goes up top and that's what he needed. If it would have gone down, that could have been very dangerous. Instead, a great defense from Basoto. That was beautiful from Basoto. You have the Bomb Tower and then the delivery to clean things up at top. So Samuel going with the, a little bit more traditional deck at the moment, of course, Bowler, Lu a Bowler GY Freeze is not completely out of the meta, but it's not central for sure. With 727 left on the Crown Tower, this is certainly Samuel's advantage right now. We see the Royal Delivery on top. That way he can use a Log or Earthquake. This interaction, we are going to see the Earthquake. I expect in Triple Elixir, that's when he kind of gets to Earthquake Cycle as the troops are crossing the bridge, and then Earthquake on defense after the Graveyard has started stacking Skeletons. And this is where things get interesting, right? Does Samuel make a push to finish that tower, or does he play a ton of defense? That EQ, in many ways, his best response to the Graveyard. 
Yeah, that's right. I think it's just going to be defense, 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 because the Archer Queen will just win every single bridge battle. It, you, you can't cross the bridge when the Archer Queen has its ability in its pocket. And you see the answer right there already as the Earthquake Cycle starts in for Samuel Basoto, now a big push coming the opposite direction, already back to Earthquake, but stacking at the bridge is Lucas. We are in triple elixir. This is where a deck like Graveyard Freeze can put the pressure on, and here we go. Inferno Dragon at the bridge, Boulder right behind, Royal Delivery to hold on, but this is stacking quite nicely. Baby Dragon to the left-hand side, AQ to hold, goes to ability. The Freeze trying to maybe get stuff off the board, but Josh, this feels like Samuel's got this pretty well locked up. Yeah, I think I think Lucas's push was great. I think he did what he could, uh, but Basoto's defense was just too solid. It wasn't perfect, there was mistakes, but really, all we're looking for is solid. Gets the tower down to 171, just needs to get those locks, those EQs, stopping everything at the bridge. Bomb tower follows, not gonna need it, and there we go. Game one, gonna go to Basoto. And you see the GY freeze in, Samuel Basoto keeping himself calm, keeping himself focused. As you said, the EQ log, all he needed, locked it down, got it done, and now goes up game number one. Yeah, phenomenal gameplay from Bosoto right there. Everything was just, he, he got way too much damage early on. I don't, I think, I think really it comes down to, he played spectacularly, he did exactly what he needed to do, but I think we can look at earlier on in the game, and that one, we can just analyze whether or not Lucas should have set himself up for success. Yeah, that's a hard one, because again, Lucas's deck cycles very slowly yeah. by comparison, and recognizing, hey, once Bowler's out of there, how many more responses is it likely for Lucas to have to shut down a Royal Hogs push? Samuel got the good read early on, got those piggies in, got a ton of damage, and it does feel like that single elixir damage, a pretty key part of of that matchup. Absolutely. It, it, I mean, yeah, it, it, it really comes down to the six elixir leads compared to the 1.5 as we head into double. It was just so awkward for him every single time. Buller is just a weird card. It, you know, you get Buller against Royal Hogs and it's a bad matchup. That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, I mean, again, that gets back to you have Bowler. But again, how quickly can you get back to Bowler over and over again, right? That's one of those big challenges, and Samwell doing a good job of capitalizing on those openings and taking a big game number one. Now, here's the interesting part, though, is that now it does feel like there's more information given to Lucas than to Samwell because a lot of the cards in that Bowler Loon Freeze deck aren't necessarily popular elsewhere, especially the or that Bowler GY Freeze. Bowler and the Freeze in particular don't take a lot away, whereas Samwell just played a lot of the key elements for cycle decks. Yeah, I mean, you have the Log, the Skellies, the Ice Spirit, uh, and just the Earthquake in general, and all four of those are so necessary when you are running those cycle decks. I, it, it does put him in a spot, but obviously I think it's better to be in this spot with a game one victory. Absolutely true. We'll see what they have in store for us, you know, both with Log out and Delivery out. It does feel like that opens up bait quite a bit. That's right. Yeah, and I mean, we both know how talented both of these players are at the Quick Cycle decks. Let's go ahead and jump into it. Game number two, right now. Let's also keep in mind that with NATO out, that opens up some good options for Samwell, both with uh, potentially, you don't think you'd see Hog, of course, having played all those cycle cards already, but maybe a minor deck here. That's right. I do like the minor as an option for Basoto. You still have the Mortar, you still have the minor. Uh, we've seen all sorts of variations with Snowball plus Poison, uh, plus, you know, Musketeer or Archer Queen. Yeah, you use the Archer Queen in game number one, so we, we just see the Musketeer swap, and you have a brilliant Mortar deck. So a bit of a staring contest here. I think this is our first one so far of our 2020 World Finals. And for those of you watching at home, some of you might not be familiar with this or think this is kind of strange or out there. Josh, talk to me a little bit about why these players might wait for the first two minutes before they actually play. Well, I mean, we saw in game number one, when you don't have the right cycle, you don't want to play. You want to try and get in the right cycle if possible. Otherwise, you're fine with waiting until double elixir. And the other thing is, when you have a big deck, a tanky deck where you want the lava, but you need that push behind it, 
you, you can't get enough elixir if you're playing immediately. So you want to use the lava once you hit the double, then you get to go skeleton dragons, the baby dragon, the mega minion behind, and you can just win in one push instead of losing in one push if you attempt early on. And for a long time, of course, it was with the beat down decks, with golem, with lava, with those heavy decks, even graveyard where you might wait for a long time before you actually play, you want that double elixir. But as we've seen the level get higher and higher of gameplay, it wouldn't be shocking if one of these two players was playing a cycle deck and just wanted to play reaction as opposed to getting out there first. Yeah, and it's so fun to see that some some cycle decks just fare really well in the double and the triple. And I think a lot of it has to do with the introduction of champions because you can just win those bridge battles with the Archer Queens, with the Golden Knights. And you hear the crowd, they're very excited to see a card played. So <laughs> let's go ahead and actually do some Clash Royale here, huh? <laughs> and there we go. We do see the lava in the back behind the left side crown tower. Golden Knight will be able to cross the bridge. If he wants to NATO pair that, he will be able to hit the tower. Obviously not going to happen. And Bowler in response from Masoto. Masoto, okay, I was gonna say he could have copied the deck. Not going to be the case right here, though. And that fireball will clear things out a bit there on the left-hand side, get some damage on the tower, but at the moment does feel like Samuel has things pretty well locked down as he does protect the Inferno Dragon here with the Golden Knight. I don't think we are going to see an aggressive push, but there we go, we do see the bullets, so I, I'm just trying to wait. I'm trying to, I was hoping that he was gonna have the aggressive push before I had to say anything. Not gonna oh, happen, but we do see wow. the freeze used on offense. And that's that going for the, the new bowler who's part magic archer, not sure what sort of things were cooked up there in the lab, but going for the lineup, nice damage. 2095 on the left-hand side, Miner goes right to the Ice Wiz, able to pull all of that back. And, you know, it does feel like we're seeing a bit of a, a, re, a rise in the heyday of what was once the most devastating combination, Ice Wiz NATO. Yeah, Ice Wiz NATO and the Inferno Dragon as well. We finally do get to see the offensive push all put together. We see the freeze. The Fly Machine is going to take out these troops fairly well, not as well as I actually previously expected. Lava. I feel like he should go in for the reset, and that's exactly what we're gonna see. I love that play from Lucas. And Lucas did have a pretty significant elixir advantage there with four on the board, plus one in the hole, but as you said, decides to reset a bit here instead. Down by quite a lot, 1088 to 2791 on that left-hand side, as we are just 15 seconds away from triple elixir. Ice Wizard will be able to take out the Skeleton Dragons. Will take its time, though. Inferno Dragon on top of the Mighty Miner is going to be brilliant. Activation already used, so that's why it was able to get so much value. Miner and the Night Witch. Oh, look at the Inferno Dragon on the right. Oh, my Look at the Inferno Dragon on the right. Will it burn it all the way down? It's done. Oh, my God, it's done. it does. Lucas can't believe it. Samwell with the double fist pump and the Inferno Dragon played to work against the Mighty Miner, completely left all on its lonesome, and it just shreds that right hand tower. It was never seen. Nobody saw it whatsoever. I only got a slight glimpse at the very end. Basoto going to take another 2-0. That is 2-0 for the first two sets in today's matchups. And this is a guy who there were some questions about coming into this weekend, but Samwell trying to answer those questions with an emphatic, yes, I yes. can, getting things done. And man, that's that's a very, very quick win there for Samwell. Let's go ahead down to the floor where Andrew Guy is standing by. All right, Sam, you and Lucas have a little bit of a rivalry going on. How does it feel to take this set off of your opponent? Você e o Lucas têm uma rivalidade acontecendo. Como é que você se sente ganhando esse set do seu oponente? Sinto ótimo. Foi muito importante ganhar esse set. E é isso. Muito feliz. I feel great. It was very important to win this set, and I'm very happy. Why did you come out with that deck in game number two? Por que que você decidiu usar esse deck no no segundo jogo? É, tinha uma boa chance dele vir com o Beatdown tentando me sniper, então eu fui com um deck bom contra o Beatdown. Então, uh, there was a big chance that he could use Beatdown to try to snap it, so he decided to go with that one. Samuel secures $50,000 and another round in our upper bracket. Back to you guys. I mean, that deck in game number two, how, how do you feel about just using that and getting that specific matchup? Honestly, I think the biggest thing in that matchup was the fact that Lucas used a lot of air cards, the Baby Dragon and the Inferno Dragon, in that first match. And it made it so Lucas's bowler and Golden Knight and Zappies 
were really able to help out with that ground control. Yeah, right here we are looking at deck number one, and we do see the Royal Hogs, and they just got so much value early on in the match. He was able to get the tower down to 1500 HP, and then it was just log plus EQ, EQ plus log, log plus EQ. Eventually, the uh, the tower gets very low. Lucas was just never able to get that, you know, that one offensive possession that he needs onto game number two right here. And we do see the Inferno Dragon graveyard against the lava. Uh, the, the Inferno Dragon making it to the tower. I, it's been a long time since I've seen that happen. Yup, Lucas just not having a nice reset for something like that. You really need to get that Night Witch down the same lane. Really, you want to be distracting that Inferno Dragon with the Night Witch bats and match up like this. But overall, once again, like I said, Bowler, Golden Knight, that sort of thing got so much value here against the ground units in Lucas's deck here. Yeah, and it was just crazy that Lucas was never able to just get that opportunity. I mean, the entire game, the tower was down to 1,000 HP, and he was still defending. He never had the opportunity to go lava in the front. It, it was one of those things where I was saying, oh, I'd like a reset, but as soon as he reset, it just put him in a worse position. I've never seen the perfect reset again and again and again just never work out. I think like you touched on earlier was the Inferno Dragon, right? Yeah. Inferno Dragon getting so much value against the Lava Hound and really difficult since he didn't have a reset to deal with that sort of thing and end up taking the tower on the right side and finishing off that game. Yeah, and I mean, just tremendous play from Basoto right there. The 2-0 has to feel phenomenal. And really, this is a player that a lot of people did not expect great things. I mean, this is the winner of the first golden ticket. We were not sure what he was going to be able to pull off. Set number one and day one, 2-0. Set number two in, what, day two, 2-0. Anyways, that's the end of that match. Rich, who do we have next? Next up, it's the kind of match that made all these people come to Finland. Two of the all-time greats. It's Morton and Moogie. All right, I mean, Juicy doesn't get any better than this. Two of the biggest fan favorites in the entire game. This one hurt my heart to have to choose between one or the other. Absolutely, me too. I end up picking Morton. One of the main reasons for that is in the only match that they've played this year, Morton actually won. That's right, he beat him in a 2-1 set. He started off doing bait, and then he went to minor poison control. Did not work out well, but he was able to close things out in game number three. I doubt we'll see the exact same order in all three of those games with the decks that they chose, but this is going to be great. Both of them looked indestructible yesterday on the stands. Moogie, it was calm, collected, it dialed in, predictive plays. Morton, it was all about that confidence and experience. Absolutely. I was very surprised by that, actually. Obviously, the four-time world finalist, Morton, very, very well vetted. He has a lot of experience. Moogie, I didn't expect him to play that calmly on stage like that. You know, I talked to him afterwards, and I was telling him, hey, Moogie, uh, that E-Spirit plus log prediction to just secure that game was absolutely beautiful. He just looked at me, and he goes, easy. Easy. That is that quite is the it. reaction. <laughs> I know, you love to hear it. And he's our world champion for a reason. Moogie in the last, not even 12 months, has racked up a quarter of a million dollars on his own. Obviously, the prize purse from last year's World Finals really added to that. But now we go in. Moogie, Morton, day two, game one. Let's go. In that third game, in that set back in March, Juicy, it was a very close graveyard mirror match that Morton was able to take the edge over Moogie and win that one set. But as you mentioned, that is the only time they've met this year, and I imagine they're both very excited to see the man standing across from them. Miner coming in on the right-hand side. Skeleton Army going to clean that up. Flying Machine for Morton, maybe a Lava Miner deck. Skeleton Army and Skelly King on the board as well. Could be a Lava Mirror matchup, but as we know, that Skarmy Skelly King combo is very versatile. Could be Mortar, could be Graveyard, could be a lot of things. Well, Morton played Mortar for me yesterday, so maybe, maybe Moogie wants to do it for me today. I know that's really what it's all about. 
And that's exactly what's going to be happening. Musketeer dropped to the bridge here on the left, going to snipe out that Inferno Dragon. Skelly King from Morton going to do a nice job of cleaning up the other Skeleton King, but here's a Mortar at the bridge. Skeleton King Billy just barely able to drop here, going to distract that Mortar for a bit here, allow those Skeleton Dragons to take it out. As one minute of regulation ticks away, we have two untouched, or four untouched towers, I should say. Maybe even six, technically, with the King Towers. Snowball gonna make sure that happens and keeps going as well, pushing those Skeleton Dragons back, preventing any chip damage. Tombstone in the middle from Morton here, just gonna prevent any sort of miner or mortars coming down. And a Miner pulls a Bascom to the right here. Miner goes to the back, obviously no NATO gonna be in this deck, so Mugi already varying up his placement, something that you need to do very early on, especially at this level. And this matchup gets a little bit interesting as we move forward in double and triple elixir because the options to clean up air is basically just the musketeer and you got to keep baiting out those bats with the arrows, correct? Absolutely. If you can bait out the bats with the arrows, then Mugi does have the opportunity to spam with the Skeleton King. You can fill up that Skeleton King ability with the Skarmie or your opponent's tombstone in a situation like this. So Morton getting a decent counter push coming down this lane, nothing to write home about. But Skeleton King does stay alive, he does pop the ability, Mugi does tick to 10, and a poison will clean all that up with just a little bit of damage in. 2444 to 2762. I really like Mugi's idea to switch lanes, go opposite here, force out some arrows, fill up the Skelly King belief from that tombstone and his own bats as well. Lava in the back from Morton. I want to see some pressure from Mugi at the bridge here. I think you have to since the arrows are out of cycle. Do you think he goes back to the right hand lane here or does he double down in the middle? I think split lane pressure could be useful. Looks like he's going to go for the same lane though. Very nice poison value yeah. there, taking out the fire chain and one of those skeleton dragons. And look at the lava hound, it's gone. Yep. Bats and musketeer on top of that lava. No need for a spell, no need for any help there. Yes, one lava pup or two ish gets on tower, but nothing significant here. Really 24, nice. 44, 22, 48. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, really nice uh, tombstone from Morton there. Just going to do a good job distracting this mortar once again. Inferno Dragon and clean that up as well. Flying Machine on the left. It's going to do its best. I like the Skelly Dragons. He's spreading yeah. out his units to prevent poison value. And a great job there using that Skarmy to protect the mortar, which got the arrows out. And now we see a little bit of an effect of that on the left hand side here. Down to 16 22. Mugi is playing a very, very nice game number one. Yeah, the most important. Oh, the Musketeers on the tower. Three shots down to 9 10 already. That was a lot of damage. The Musketeer protection is on point for Mugi right now. Morton's trying everything in his power to try and take out these Musketeers, but look how much value. Flying Machine's dead. Skelly Dragon's dead. And now here comes the Miner on another push. Mugi did win his 20 win challenge on his at least first account with a Miner Mortar deck. But in terms of this, he's in our competitive scene. He's gone 50% with Mortar as his win condition. And an easy game one win, if you will, for Mugi. Does the Muskie get it or does the Mortar shot get it? It's the Kobe shot from the Mortar, and Mugi's up one. Wow, today my predictions are going to the wind. I was first place yesterday, but <laughs> Moogie's looking like he's very comfortable in this set right now, absolutely controlling that game, never letting Mortar, Morton ever to have a chance to get a good Lava Hound push. All right, let's take a look here at a replay that we have as our two competitors decide what decks they want to bring out in game number two. And Juicy, this is where things started to go uh, from bad to worse. Absolutely, look at that Musketeer taking out the Skeleton King, then the Flying Machine, and then locking on the tower here. Morton just not able to react quick enough on that one. Let's take a look here at our community predictions. This one will be a fascinating one. I think a lot of people were probably left with their favorite person and then trying to decide between who they thought would actually win, and the numbers do not lie. 52% to 48%, basically split right down the middle. And if you guys are wondering where we're getting these numbers, event.clashroyale.com. I've already gotten most of the rewards. I got that uh, viewer badge, which was nice because we're here watching it, but we got tower skins, we got gold, we got gems. Make sure you check all of that out at event.clashroyale.com. And of course, you can follow along with our entire three day Clash Fest there. Back to the action juice. Game number two. You know, I think the best thing here for Morton is that he has a ton of experience on the live stage, winning and losing. So you know he's not going to be rattled by dropping game number one. But for Mookie, he's been basically perfect through this entire 2022 finals. 
He really has the predictions on point, the deck picks on point. I think that's one thing that we thought that Mugi might have troubles with is his own deck picks. I don't know how he's communicating with his analysts and his coaches, but so far it's been perfect. Telepathically, Juicy, I believe. Telepathically. I believe it's telepathic. Uh, yeah, and I also think when you look at his numbers, I love the deck choice in game number one. As I was talking about, Mugi's only played Mortar 12 times in our competitive CRL format this year, and he was only at a 50% tick there, which is actually not what you would expect him to come out with in game number one, but then you hop over to the other side of it. He's 69% with Hog Rider, 65 with Graveyard, 80 with Royal Giant, and above 70 for, at 75 for Drill. So you think he maybe goes to one of his stronger win conditions, or does that become a little bit predictable? Honestly, I think he does. Mugi yeah. is one of those players where he doesn't need to always get that really good matchup. He relies on his skill to outplay his, his opponent. That's right, game number two coming your way. You can see there the little bit of a creator badge for Morton, one of the biggest channels in English and in German, getting close to half a million subs very, very quickly. Log here from Morton, followed up by a ghost from Mugi. Giant Skelly in the back. See another Giant Skelly deck from Morton, maybe RG, and most likely a drill bridge yep. spam from Mugi. I'd be really surprised if he pack a bridge spam in a situation like this. 100%. Mugi does look like he is going to go to drill like we talked about. It's his most popular win condition. He's played it 24 times in competitive with a 75% win rate. Morton on the other side of it looks like he could be going with another maybe drill deck with a different version, are you thinking, or you think it could still be RG? I definitely think it's, it's RG. RG. There it is. Oh, the failed, oh, the failed kite on that Gold Knight dash. Huge connection there, but the RG is taking some nice pop shots over here on the right. Yeah, RG just ticking away on that tower. You can hear the crowd getting excited, but the counter push is coming in. Morton has six elixir to deal with it. He's got to deal with the Royal Ghost first, and then the cannon cart, and one giant skeleton should be able to do it all. And that's what this deck is all about, right? You want to have very nice defenses and huge counter pushes with all of your bridge spam units. But unfortunately for Mugi, this giant Skelly is just going to absolutely clean everything on this land. Morton, not a big time Royal Giant player in competitive. He has played at 18 times. His numbers are really all the way across the board. He's very versatile. But with Royal Giant, he's at 50% win rate as well. So maybe trying to go to something that is obviously not as predictable with the cards that remain after game number one. This is most likely the game plan from the start, even after that drop of game one. And that's the difference here. Mugi going to his comfort, more than trying to be unpredictable. I really would like to be Mugi in a situation like this, where you know exactly how to play your deck, and the comfortability is going to mean that you know, things are going to go well for you. And another Golden Knight connection here for Mookie. Morton cannot catch them. 1959 on one side, but Morton is in the lead with 1766 with that big time uppercut early on from the Royal Giant. A lot of elixir expenditure on the left hand side for that ghost. Are we going to see an RG to compete and push with this? I don't think so. So Ewiz and Barbara are going to clean everything up here. But. Not exactly the interaction you want, yeah. but the Ewiz does stay alive. Log actually changed that story quite quickly. Drill on the counter push. First drill we've seen this match. Ghost is going to pick that up very nicely. Giant Skelly going to prevent that Gold Knight dash finally. There we go. That's Yeah, finally, I think, <laughs> is a great way to put it, Juicy. And I bet Morton feels the exact same way. Now he's trying to turn the tables as 20 seconds Ooh. remain in our regulation. A lightning comes down to clear the path. But Mugi has 10 elixir. Ooh. The giant skeleton gets to the tower. Is it there? That is oh there. My God. It's there. 962 remains. 1959 is the lowest for Morton. And the German swings back into the game. One giant skelly bomb is all it takes. Mugi had the elixir. Maybe the nerves are starting to come in finally for him as well. Just not able to get that. He was down in time. Yeah, I mean, you talk about nerves. I'm pretty sure Morton's heart rate right now is about 37, whereas Mugi's might be around 200. You gotta be feeling good after a connection like that. I think Mugi does have a chance to maybe come back. You're not in the lightning cycle radius quite yet, but you have to have perfect defense from here on out. And now it's the thing with the late lightning, early lightning. How's it gonna work? You see this time Morton not doing it too early, but the RG does get, I think, the retarget on the cannon, but the lightning damage came in. Yep, no RG shots there, only lightning damage. Mugi needs to stack everything this left hand side, but the problem with that is you do give the Lightning Valley, so he decides to go to, in the opposite lane here. Magic Archer in the back. 
Gold Knight in the back. He needs to build up a very big push in order to come back right now. Yeah, and the toughest thing with that is we've seen this numerous times already in day one. You just start stacking that giant skeleton in the lane that you know your opponent's going to pursue, and it just really clogs it up. And of course, that giant skeleton bomb makes it really, really tough. Magic Archer almost always getting taken out by these giant skelly bombs. Cannon Cart goes on the left-hand side. Bar Barrel plus Magic Archer here on the right to try and get a connection. Quick E Spear plus Hunter. Magic Archer lines up. Moogie's got some shots in. The Giant Skeleton turns around. The Giant Skeleton turns around 528 to 655. And all of a sudden, this game is really close. Close. Two Giant Skellies on the board, though. Oh, here comes the RG. Can Moogie defend this? This is huge for Morton. He needs to make sure that RG gets on tower. Moogie lightning, or NATO's it back. No lightning in yet. Drill on the defense, that is the power of the drill. You can use it for offense, you can use it for a defense. A perfect log, a perfect log! The lightning comes in, it needs to come down, and Morton will even things up. We're going to game three. If there's any match in this entire tournament that I want to see a game three, it's this one right here. Wow, what a game number three. Two. And again, you look at Morton and Moogie, both of them have so much experience. They're both incredibly confident. They look incredibly dialed in. And you can see the audience right now losing their minds as you and I lose our voices. <laughs> yeah, losing our voices for sure. We're heading into the third match. We have RG out. We have Mortar. We have Drill out. We're going back. I know, I'm guessing we're gonna see some more comfort from Morton in this game three. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing is Morton, he goes RG and he goes to Lava Miner in his first two games, which is just odd because really, uh, <laughs> they're not his best win conditions. But you see how well he plays. That's what I was saying at the top of it. Morton is incredibly versatile, incredibly versatile. I mean, you watch him. He streams eight hours a day, eight days a week. So how could he not know how to play through every win condition? He decides to bust it out here on the biggest stage. And you love to see a comfort behind victory in game number two. But now it's a best of one for a secured $50,000. And of course, if you lose this match, you go down to that lower bracket where you could be saying goodbye today. Yeah, we are going to be going over those elimination matches later. I can see Morton looking at his notes right now. I'm sure he has prepared a lot of different decks for any sort of outcome in the first couple games to switch and modify everything for that duels formatting. Yeah, whoever loses this match will be sent down to play against Dominic, who had a very, uh, we'll say, unique opening to his World Finals career. However, he was able to stay alive. He was able to secure $30,000 in spite of his unique start, I think, again, is the best way to put it. But that's neither here nor there. Game three coming your way in just moments between Morton and Moogie. And who did you say you predicted, Morton? I did predict Morton. I wanted to take that stage experience. That was my mindset on there. But like I said earlier, Moogie is playing so well for this first time being on stage, and I'm scared I'm going to be wrong. I know. This is a really, really big moment because losing that safety net of that extra life makes you wonder how they're going to perform once the pressure is on the line. But pressure on the line right now. Game three. Let's go. Stage is set. The players are ready. Morton using a tablet. Moogie also with his creator code on the bottom of your screen with the phone. Moogie always sending out that good luck before the match. A gob barrel coming from Morton. This is Morton's favorite win condition. He has a very low usage rate because he doesn't want to be too predictable. But yeah. when he does use bait, he's got an 83% win rate. That's right. And only 18 games with bait in our competitive format. An 83% win rate. And if you guys remember last year's World Finals, he had an incredible come from behind victory when he looked like he was in a horrible matchup against Mini Minter. But Morton can always, always come back in those final moments. Speaking of horrible matchup, check this one out. He's yeah. got the roll delivery, he's got the log, and he has the fire spirit. Moogie has come prepared against Morton for his favorite win condition. On the other hand, Morton does have that bomb tower versus the pigs. That, that will be true. useful. That is a very, very good point that you make, Juice. Heading into the rest of this match, Morton really needs to try and outcycle that log and put himself in a situation where Moogie does not have enough elixir to get that roll delivery down in time. That's the, one of the only ways to get damage in a situation like this. It's so tough to keep up with the cycle of either of these decks, and you know they're going to be on top of that cycle. Dark Goblin gets some good value here on top of that cannon. 
Really nice queen taking out the Dark Goblin. Generally, that's what you want to be doing. You always want to take out the Glass Cannon with your Archer Queen because she does provide that counter push value in two ways. You have the ability, you can get on tower with that, but you also have the three card cycle to cycle a bunch of pigs and maybe outcycle that bomb tower. You can see there, Morton not happy about that one shot. And, you know, a lot of people at home might be wondering, it's just one shot, it's still early on, but in this type of matchup, when it's quick, it's fast, it's loose, every little stab, every little shot from that AQ counts, it is all very, very important. Mugi on the other side, 11 times he's ran Royal Hogs and only a 55% clip there. The other thing about a matchup like this where it's so tight and you're defending each other so well, it's very important every little bit of damage because a lot of the time it's going to come down to spell cycle later in Triple Elixir. Exactly. Guards also very nice versus the Archer Queen. Morton making sure to over defend his left side tower or right side tower here to make sure to not let him increase that damage lead. I know, you talk about the matchup for Moogie, but like you said, Juice, there's such good responses for Morton as well to deal with the Hog, to deal with the AQ. And that's Snowball. I mean, that's like the spell that you want in this situation. There you go, Snowball comes down, pushes <gasps> the Hogs away. And the Hogs on the left-hand side getting some great damage in. The big thing there is Morton was finally able to chip away a little bit with the Goblin Barrel. He outcycled the log. He went for the Goblin Barrel while Moogie was focused on offense. Moogie thought he could do the Ice Spirit or Fire Spirit plus Skeletons combo, but he played the Goblin Barrel in the front. That's oh, a huge play. And he's late on the delivery. Another three stab from the Goblin Barrel. 2034 to 2150. Morton feeling himself. He goes, all right, I'm at 10. There's a rocket. And Moogie has to be feeling the pressure. Bomb Tower and Dark Gob on the defense. Wow. There's no way these pigs are going to get through for much. Maybe one hit. One the, little piggy snout. That's it. That's it. But the rocket is so valuable in a situation like this. Earthquake is not enough to keep up with something like that. Morton goes slightly tricky on that barrel to the back instead of the front. I really like the idea to play the Arch Queen in the back here. Get that three card cycle activated. And you need to be spamming pigs and out cycle that bomb tower. This is your moment. And I just don't know how he's going to beat this cycle. Morton is so on top of it. The Ice Spirit, I believe, still allowed the Fire Spirit to connect. It did. 14 13, 11 42, 85 seconds. Check out, he used this pigs. No, the pigs did not keep the Arch Queen alive. Can he break through this bomb tower right now? Goblin gets a stab. Piggy's in the lane. Snowball comes down with the earthquake. 1251, 902. Morton is a couple rockets and a log away. Or Snowball, excuse me. Skeletons do pick up the Dark Goblin. He's trying to defend. Dark Goblin's on the tower. Log comes on the Goblin Barrel. These pigs are chipping away, though. This match is so close. Morton goes for the rocket. Moogie needs to apply so much pressure right now. Morton going in with the Dark and he wants that elixir on defense. It's on. Gonna come it's down. on. The Dark Goblin's on. 63 HP. I don't think Log does enough. He, he needs definitely does it. There's the Mighty Miner. Mighty Miner changes it up. And there's, there's a the rocket. rocket. There's the, the rocket. Has the Queen. It. Oh, the Queen almost got the shot. The Queen almost got the shot. The Rocket takes it just in time. The four-time world finalist takes down number one in the world. Wow. I was finally right with the prediction. <laughs> finally. <laughs> we got one. What a match. What a game. Congrats some more on that one. Rich I'm not going to send it to Rich. I want to keep geeking <laughs> out about this. Rich, take it away, brother. All right, here we are after one of the most amazing best of threes we've seen. The German fans going crazy behind us here. Morton, that was an insane matchup. Let's start in game number two. A bit of a scare with the Magic Archer. That's been a, a challenge for you in the past. Talk to me about that moment. I mean, I was kind of remembering the Magic Archer from Surgical, but it was a pretty good matchup. He was playing pretty well, but yeah, I knew I can win this because it was just a good matchup. So I had to focus and yeah, game three was done. It wasn't really close. Yeah, we go into game number three and the one thing everyone wants to see is you, one of the all-time greats with bait, playing bait. What did you think when you saw that matchup? What were the adjustments you made to get that win? So I was like not sure what he's going to play because I thought he's going to play Royal Giant. So I had to do this decision um, based on that. But yeah, the matchup wasn't that good. But I got like a rocket side going. So that was like for sure the key and defending pretty well. And he also missed like two battles. So I knew like he's nervous at this situation. So I really tried to punish that. All right. And one more quick one. You got this very loud German contingent behind you. How does it feel to have your countrymen with you here in Helsinki? It's absolutely awesome. It feels like I'm playing in Germany. And I really appreciate all the support. Thank you. All right, Morton, moving on. Back to you at the desk. Oh, what?
What a set there, Juicy. You heard Morton talking about knowing he had a good matchup in that game number three. Obviously, we were sitting here at the very beginning going, well, Moogie also has a great matchup. And I love that Morton recognized a couple missed interaction means my opponent is nervous. We can go ahead and move on past this. We know how quick those decks cycle around. Morton just on top of it a little more than Moogie. Yeah, the outplay was insane. I, I mean, he's, I think he's being modest by saying that is an easy matchup. If Moogie just would have played a little bit better, prevented a couple goblin shots here or there, it would have been a much different story. All right. Let's take a look here at these decks. It was a fascinating three deck choices. A little bit of a surprise here for Morton. He did look a bit uncomfortable playing this Lava deck. Talk to me about this matchup, Juice. Yeah, it really is in the court of Moogie, and Moogie did take that home. He played it so well, using his three-card cycle, getting those Musketeers down always, but more importantly, protecting the Musketeer. Morton only has the arrows to try and take it out, and it wasn't enough. Game number two was a uh, <laughs> breathtaking, to say again, back and forth between these two. It looked like Moogie was going to steal it at the end with that wonderful NATO back, the giant skeleton distracted by the drill, but then Morton goes, I'm going to do a full send, left-hand lane, takes the game, and then game number three, <laughs> you, you got to take this one. <laughs> game number three, talked about a bit. Moogie has a lot of counters for the barrel. Morton has a lot of counters for the pigs. It ended up coming down to spell damage. Rocket does more than Earthquake, and Morton also was able to find a couple goblin chips here and there. The placement on the goblin barrel was absolutely imperative. Fire spirit skeletons for Moogie a lot of the time was not enough to prevent all the damage. AC, I'm pretty sure you were losing your mind right over there, uh, but I wasn't looking because I was losing my mind right here. What are your initial thoughts before we get into a breakdown? Well, let me just say, my mouth started like this, and then kept getting bigger and bigger because <laughs> that was the greatest thing I have ever seen. I, I mean, that uh, it wasn't that there was misplays like uh, like firing all over the board. It was just smart play after smart play. Try to outplay your opponent yep. over and over again. What are you breaking down for us, man? Okay, so we are going to do the ending of game number three. We have to, so we are going to start it right here. Okay, I can already stop it. I can already stop it. I want to draw a line right here because of this amount of elixir. He can go bomb tower on top just because he doesn't have the elixir for the earthquake. So I can already exit out of that, and I can already go back into the game. The skeletons plus the fire spirit, not enough to stop the goblin barrel, gets the tower down to 902. 1251, 2902. All right, both players kind of resetting. And we, again, it's these dark goblins at the bridge that create so much pressure, oh. able to get that one shot. Guards are not going to be enough to stop the piggies from getting a lot of damage. Still 733 to 771. Earthquake cycle coming out for Moogie, but with the rocket, it's not going to be enough. Another dark goblin. This is one of those That's times huge. you have to learn how to play the fire spirit, the ice spirit, the skellies correctly on top of the dark goblins. It is possible to stop a dark goblin from getting to the tower. Again, Royal Hogs at the bridge, plus Earthquake, Bomb Tower doing just enough. We are gonna see the Mighty Miner come out. I saw the six elixir, the seven elixir. Play the rocket, please play the rocket. <laughs> rocket comes down, Snowball on the Archer Queen does get the shot, and Morton takes game number three. I mean, just such a fascinating exercise of counting that elixir, knowing when to send those rockets in and still being able to defend with just enough. So the German, with the most World Finals experience, stays in our upper bracket, secures another $50,000, and of course, we'll move on to face the winner of our next matchup. What a weekend for Morton. Moogie, still in it though. No worries for all you Moogie fans out there. He will be going down to play against Dominic a little bit later on today. Rich, how you doing? How's your heart rate? I'm barely keeping it together right now because we go from one great matchup to two OGs of the game looking to cement their already phenomenal legacies in Clash Royale history. Give it up for KK and Air Surfer! The confidence of these two respective players has to be through the roof, if you will. Not only did 
Air Surfer stay alive in our final upper round bracket uh, match yesterday, but it was KK who was able to beat Mohamed Light 2 to 0 and pull the biggest upset so far of the weekend. Now, while we did just see our current world champion drop to the lower bracket, I don't think Morton beating him is really the definition of an upset. I think that's just a phenomenal back and forth. However, when you look at this one, two guys, maybe a little under celebrated in competitive, but loved by the community. Absolutely, and when we talked about the predictions earlier, I was the only one that picked KK, and it was for the reason that you just said. I think KK is so confident after taking out Muhammad Light in the first day that he's gonna be in a really good situation for this match. And it was Pandora who fell to Air Surfer and then fell later on in the day. We had to say goodbye to him. Unfortunately for your Pandora fans out there and for us, we're, we're big fans of Pandora. But for KK and Air Surfer, this is a big one. Now, you're moving on. You have this lower part of the upper bracket that gets pretty intense as we keep going. And of course, the person that will be facing off will be Morton down the line. But first, here we go. KK, Air Surfer, game number one. And a bit of a stop and stare here to start our day, or start their day, I should say. Good lucks from both players. Zappy's in the back from Air Surfer. A very calm start. KK with the Ice Wizard. Interesting. KK does like RG. He does like a graveyard. Wouldn't be surprised to see a graveyard, maybe even splasher from KK here. Looks like it might be Barbarrel plus Ice Wizard out. Barbarrel cycled behind. King Tower there and a Tombstone, feeling like it's going to be GY. Splash up one of those decks KK is pretty comfortable with. He did win the 20 win challenge with it. Juicy, you are a big time lover of Splash Yard. You are exceptional when playing it. How do you feel about this matchup thus far? So far, I mean, I think KK has a fairly solid matchup. I'm not sure about Air Surfer's win condition quite yet. It is Pigs. That is not too good for Air Surfer in my mind. With the Tombstone, with the Nato, with the Slow, with the Bar Barrel, there are so many options. There really is. As long as KK... Oh, but the Arch Queen! The Arch Queen actually makes a huge difference here. Queen's one of those cards that really gets a lot of value versus Splash Shard. If Air Surfer can protect his Arch Queen in this matchup, he's gonna have a solid chance. That's right. He, you know, he can get that Arch Queen down in the back. Giant Skeleton up at the bridge to body block, make sure no tanks come across. And interesting for both of these competitors, the mini P.E.K.K.A. also kind of a fascinating pull. I think the other thing here to mention is KK is not using a champion in his Splasher deck. He's using the Valkyrie. That's definitely going to put a damper on his ability to keep up with Cycle. And yeah, if he had a Skeleton King maybe for the mini P.E.K.K.A., it could be a lot more useful. Valkyrie's still going to get some solid value against those Royal Hogs. KK, 68% win rate with Graveyard in our competitive scene. And do you, you think that's a mistake to not have Skeleton King in this deck? I, I, I'd be surprised if he uses it anywhere else, and maybe he will. Maybe he'll come out with a Mortar Skeleton King deck we've seen a few times. But do you think not playing Splash Yard with a champion is a mistake at this point in this game. I really do. Uh, unless he's specifically trying to save it for like a mortar spam deck later down the line, I think a champion can help you a lot, especially when you are going against the Archer Queen, in order to outcycle the Archer Queen and apply a lot of pressure with multiple graveyards in Triple Elixir. So not a whole lot has happened thus far, and no surprise there as graveyard players usually like to sit and wait for a while before they go in. Really big mistake there on the early activation of the Archer Queen ability is really going to provide almost no value. And that is not something you want to be doing in this matchup. You want to get insurmountable amounts of value from your Archer Queen because KK just really doesn't have a great job of stopping it. So Giant Skeleton set up in the back here for Air Surfer as KK still decides when he wants to pull the trigger on his win condition. The one nice thing about having the Valkyrie is you can cycle multiple of them. So he's not afraid to cycle that in the back, and he knows he can cycle back to another one on defense fort versus the Royal Hogs if he needs to. Ice Wiz and Baby Dragon on this left-hand side, just kind of stalling, stunning everything out. Once again, Valkyrie is back in cycle for that Archer Queen. And we are going for a Graveyard now as it hits into overtime. First GY down, Barbarrel comes in, Giant Skeleton in the back to clean up. Obviously, Giant Skeleton not the best 
option for cleanup, but it is going to be great in terms of that counter push. Fisherman up to body block, make sure not a lot of splash gets on tower, but still gets two shots in here late. 21-84 to 27-19. I really like the patience from KK there. He waited for the Arch Queen to be out of cycle before he went for that graveyard, and it was the perfect moment. That big dragon getting a lot of value, preventing the counter push and getting some nice shots in the tower. And he might go right back in here. We'll find out in just one moment. Instead, he sets up an Ice Wiz on the other side. AQ is out of cycle for the moment. Mirror and last card. Mirror giant skeleton comes down and a graveyard defensively here for KK. I'm sure he's very, very happy he did not sell out. I respect that defensive graveyard. A lot of the time it is a nice play against a big tank like that, especially when he wants to save his Valkyrie for the Royal Hog specifically. Archer Queen doing her thing, getting a lot of value once again here, kind of taking out everything, forcing out a lot of Elixir. Here comes a Valkyrie. Are we going to see Graveyard? Absolutely. Baby Dragon is down the board with no Queen and Cycle is definitely the right moment. And Juicy, just one thing to talk about here. Actually, let's look at this final moments. 15 seconds remain. Huge arrows value. Valkyrie on the defense, getting some nice, doing a nice job of just cleaning up absolutely everything on the board. KK should have this in the bag. No giant skeleton bomb to get on top of tower. You know an arm and a leg is going to be spent on that Archer Queen. And with two seconds remaining, Air Surfer will drop game number one. Mugi, undefeated, I believe, on the weekend. Yeah, KK really just controlled... Or KK, I'm sorry, undefeated on the weekend. <laughs> KK just really controlled that match. That was precise splash shard gameplay. Defending, going for a graveyard here or there, but overall just making sure your opponent is never getting any sort of damage. And you can see there, KK does bring out a piece of paper to look at his notes. The players are allowed one piece of paper per their match day to take notes and bring out for any individual they may be going up against. And one little caveat about this match, Juicy, is whoever loses this match gets sent down to the lower bracket and immediately has to play again. Now, we will be giving them a little bit more time in between those two matches, but you know that is so tough to sit back and reset in that short amount of time. However, we still have maybe two more games coming your way. Air Surfer seemed like he had a lot of difficulty getting on offense throughout that entire game. Yeah, never really getting that right opportunity. I think the biggest thing with that was the Valkyrie. We talked about it. He was able to cycle back to all like them always for the dual lane pressure. I think the other big mistake from Air Surfer is we saw some incorrect queen usage. You have to be abusing Arch Queen to the absolute optimal ability in that matchup. Yeah, you've been really on top of all those abilities from champions. Just when I'm sitting backstage with you, let's take a look here really quickly at our predictions. 66% for KK and only 34 for Air Surfer. A bit of a surprise there, but I guess a lot of people, you know, have this thought in the back of their mind. If you're able to 2 0 Mo, maybe you're able to work through Air Surfer as well. How do you feel about these predictions? That's exactly my thought. I think the other thing is KK has a huge community behind him. Yes, he does. So there's probably a lot of those guys going in there popping some votes. Yeah, they don't care. They could be playing against all the other competitors at once, 15 on one, and they'd still go for KK, or I guess at this point, 11 on one. So KK, you can see, uh, I wouldn't call it nervous. I just say it looks like he's dialed in, ready to go. Air Surfer uh, on the other side of it, he's had a good amount of being on the live stage, whether it is in uh, terms of way back in the day. Uh, I, I guess it is only in terms of way back in the day. We were back there in the studio with him in 2018, 2019. He's played on a live stage. He's played on those big towers. He does look very calm right now. Yeah, very stoic, very motionless, and that's what you want to do. You yes. want to take all the motions out of it, win or lose, and go into that next match playing your best game of Clash Royale. Yeah, and the players look like they're about to have their deck set as we hop into game number two in just one moment. Again, the loser of this set will go down to face off against Humble Keith, who you imagine him and his coach or his team are just sitting and analyzing absolutely every single thing that these guys have ever done in their career. You know, you never know exactly who you're going to get, so you want to lightly prepare for both and then over prepare once you get that winner coming through, or I guess I should say that loser coming through. So Air Surfer and KK, we're just waiting for them to finally set their decks. And looking at Graveyard, or excuse me, Royal Hogs for Air Surfer, only a 57% win rate. But I don't really think it was about just the Royal Hogs. It was just, I don't know about that deck specifically. Do you think Mirror is still viable? And I'll let you pick up that thought right after we hop into game number two. Yeah, I really, I don't think that Mir is very viable anymore after that nerf. Um, 
the other thing in that matchup is even if you do mirror your giant skellies, that 5% HP nerf kind of compounds on the mirror nerf. Oh, interesting. So I think he, if you want to win that match, he needs to be using the Arch Queen better, like I said, but maybe going for some mirror roll hogs. He never went for something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, that is always a devastating thing. You don't have a lot of elixir, you don't have a great response, and that second set of royal hogs comes down. Can be brutal. But Dark Goblin back out. He's been a champion for a handful of people today. Vitor, or uh, this weekend, Vitor and Morton reaping the rewards of one of my favorite Ooh. cards in the game. And that's going to be three big shots in. Barrel goes to the back. Arrows come down. And Brawler, while maybe under celebrated, had a big day yesterday. He definitely did. That Dark Goblin and that Fire Spirit connection at the start there is something you never want to see if you are KK. Air Surfer's got to be feeling great right now. As a bait player, get that much damage in the first minute is huge. 22 16 to two untouched towers. And if you had to pick, what would you say KK is running right now? How do you feel about this uh, lava matchup? Definitely lava hounds. Matchup wise, it's really going to depend on Air Surfer's building. A lot of the time, this is going to be like a bomb tower or a cannon. But if Air Surfer does happen to have an Inferno Tower, he's going to be absolutely vibing. Air Surfer ran into Inferno Tower yesterday, and while he thought he still had a good matchup, it did not appear that way in his game number two. He was able to take that set. As the first lava comes down, Dark Goblin goes opposite lane with Mighty Miner, and this is usually the idea. They drop a lava, you got a pressure opposite lane, and I don't know what KK's gonna do to stop this push. Arrows is definitely not enough. That's, that Dark Goblin has been locked. The, that's not the play. You gotta let it go. The tower's already gone. The arrows come down. That's three elixir out of your wallet, out of your bank. And now Air Surfer has a lot to deal with, just a lava hound. Not only does he not have that three elixir that he could be supporting this Lava Hound with, he doesn't have the arrows for that second Dark Goblin that Air Surfer places right now. That Dark Goblin's gonna clean up everything. If this Miner could connect, it and could be enough, but it doesn't. And look at that, almost a double drop there to make sure maybe if it doesn't get right on top of that Miner immediately, the cannon will help, the Mighty Miner will help. Beautiful protection there of your glass cannon. Learned that yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> That, that was a beautiful interaction there. KK, with 30 seconds left, I don't think he can come back. So first Dark Goblin cycle down. Fire Spirit does get the leap on all of that. Great placement, great timing, and the rocket gonna come in. Nice. It hits everything but the lava, but that's okay. Mighty Miner comes down for Air Surfer, and it feels like we are at an inevitable game. Inferno number Dragon. three! Inferno the Inferno Dragon is on the tower! No way. The Inferno Dragon is on the tower! I cannot believe the right there! That Mighty Miner ability was not quite able to hit the Inferno Dragon, not able to push it back, and the guards took out that Fire Spirit, and now we have another Mighty Miner oh, in the tower! But Air Surfer decides to respond with an Inferno wow. Dragon of his own! The Mighty Miner on the tower after the Inferno sizzled it down, and if you just saw Jack's face, Jack is Air Surfer, he lets out a big sigh of relief and a big smile on his face. Oh my goodness! I mean, for one second there, you're finding yourself in a really, really rough spot. Like you said, Mighty Miner Bomb doesn't push that Inferno back, doesn't have enough Elixir to respond. The Inferno's locked on, and at that point, you have to recognize the Inferno is locked on. I'm not going to be able to kill it, so what can I do to make the best of this situation? Yeah, we've been seeing the Mighty Miners and the Inferno Dragons absolutely drop towers today. That Mighty Miner ability to squeeze on that right-hand side tower is such an important spot, and I think KK just didn't recognize that the Mighty Miner ability would be back in I, cycle. Yes, that is so great that you point that out, Juicy. You hit the nail on the head. The second Mighty Miner ability is a pretty rare thing to happen in a Mighty Miner's lifespan. A lot of time, it's cycle it in the back, use that three-card cycle. If I can get one ability in to either push back defense or to drop that bomb on the tower, it's always great, obviously. But he gets the second one in, and it's because KK's distracted. He's taking that right-hand tower with the Inferno. He thinks he's breathing more life back into that game. But Air Surfer steals it in those final seconds. And then when you look at that average elixir cost, you can see why Air Surfer was able to create so much space, so much damage in single elixir. But then you saw KK kind of overwhelm at the end there. Yeah, overwhelming with the arrows in cycle, right? The biggest thing in that matchup is Air Surfer is going to be trying to cycle multiple Dark Goblins, but when you can take out that Dark Goblin with the arrows on offense, yeah. the defense all of a sudden becomes very difficult because all you have is Rocket. Yeah, and that is not going to be enough. There was that really, really nice Rocket from Air Surfer, but the thing is, your opponent is KK. He is too good to give you all that value and the Inferno Dragon. Yeah, you got the Skelly Drags. Yeah, you got the Flying Machine, but that was already on the board. The Inferno cannot be played 
placed in the same trajectory, the same radius of where that rocket's gonna come down. So a great, great job by both of our competitors. And we go to another game three. <sighs> Juicy, do you still stand by your original prediction? Honestly, I think I am. KK did have a tough run in that matchup, but if he goes to something he's more comfortable with, maybe RG, I think he's gonna be in a situation where you can confidently dismantle Air Surfer. On the other end, Air Surfer is one of those players, he does like to switch his decks up, and maybe he's expecting that. Maybe he wants to snipe and counter snipe in that situation. All right, here we go. Game number three between Air Surfer and KK. Whoever loses has to come right back on stage. Let's go. And the patented Air Surfer emo will say that until he retires because it makes me happy to say it. <laughs> makes me happy when you say it too. <laughs> Ice or Fire Spring is countered quite nicely by Snowball, Spear Gobs, and Bats are going to cancel out as well, and a log from KK. So it looks like a cycle mirror matchup for win conditions. I'm not quite sure yet. A drill from KK. See how Air Surfer defends here. Skeleton King, very nice defense. So maybe a mortar versus drill cycle situation right now. There's the mortar. Mortar comes down. Mighty Miner to catch. And Cannon to soak the damage. I like that candy. You have to play that. You don't want to allow the mortar to splash on your Mighty Miner and the tower there. Yeah. Although this will clean up those Spear Goblins, maybe not optimally placed there by KK. Fire Spirit has to come down to distract that mortar shot. And now here comes a Miner. Bats are here. The Snowball is in cycle, though. And Drill comes out again here for KK. He goes for the free log, maybe looking for a Skarmy, but it's not there. He does get one Goblin shot, but I'm not sure how useful that is. Huge counter push right now, and KK doesn't really have that much Elixir right now. He's got four, he places the Mighty Miner, but the Skelly King ability is gonna drop, and that Mortar is very healthy right about now. Yeah, Mortar very, very healthy. It should lock Ooh. on Tower, and that is a big time lock, so Spear Goblin's got that have to come down. Maybe a Snowball after this Musketeer defends. No, decides to just let that Mortar go. Musketeer will play double lane duty here, 25-6, 2480 to 2520. Spear God's actually getting quite a bit of a chip here. Here comes a bit of a counter push. Minor musky bats. Fire Spirit is not oh, able to wow. jump. It's not There's jumping. The Musketeer is protected, so a fireball has to come down. But you know KK is thirsting for Elixir. We'll see how Air Surfer wants to punish. Maybe a Quick Mortar? Quick Mortar would be nice. KK does have that cannon cycle. If he does go for Mortar, he needs to protect it. He decides to cycle a Snowball. Wait for KK's next play. Here comes the drill. Skarmy finally does come out. Skeleton King to the front log. Gonna fill those souls right up. And when Air Surfer has run Skeleton wow. King, he has a 80% win rate, and that is a beautiful mortar prediction with the cannon. You love to see that. One of my favorite plays in the game, because I hate mortar so much, what? nothing against you. Get out of here. You're <laughs> off the desk, Juice. We don't have that blasphemy here. <laughs> <laughs> Miner is chipping away. On the other hand, Air Surfer is constantly perfectly defending these drills. There's really no connection happening for yeah. KK right now. And I love the placement of that Musketeer too. Gonna clean up the bats. Gonna be far enough away to not get fireball value. 23-31 for Air Surfer. 16-50 for KK. Cannon comes down. No attempt at a block. Maybe a little surprising because KK has been so on top and you know that cannon's right back in cycle. But still, Air Surfer decides to not overspend and go right back. To defense. There are mind games with that sort of thing as well. Yeah. A lot of the time, if you do go cannon at the bridge right away, like you did last time, Air Surfer would maybe not predict, expecting uh, uh, KK to right. defend in a different way. That's a very good point that you make. The mind games at this level are always fascinating, and the Skeleton King actually turns around to try to help clean up that drill. Now 1776 to 1650, the gap narrows by quite a bit. Speaking of the gaps narrowing, the Miner is very, very consistent, but as we head into Triple Elixir, the Drill is able to apply a lot more pressure, so we might be seeing KK take a damage lead very soon. And KK does get the Fireball on top of the Musketeer and on top of the Princess Tower there. We'll see how he wants to respond. Fire Spirit to Kite first. Now the Cannon comes down. Still nothing there to block by Air Surfer, and that's just a tough drop for him. KK's doing a great job, as you said, Juicy, with those mind games, but Miner Almost taken for those bats. Does get on tower for a few seconds, And that's going to splash on tower. 
Mortar gets a huge shot. I think Air Surfer needs to be protecting his mortars he does. more. I mean, My 6K experience tells me he does. <laughs> Mortar's gonna drop and, and there another it is. And now KK knew that he was gonna go for it. Gets it down early on. And you love to see plays like that. KK limiting the future, but look at that Stormy. Log comes down late. Bat on the, the right hand well. tower. Bat is going to town. 561, 1403. 30 seconds left. You have to keep this Mighty Miner alive. Get that three card cycle rolling and go for drill on drill on drill. But Air Server has so many counters. He has this Garmy and he oh, has that Skelly King. The cannon behind no. the princess. A massive misplay for KK. 13 seconds left. And after that mistake, there's just no way you can come back. Miner's going to be chipping away. Drill is not enough. And that's going to be game. Air Surfer staying alive in our upper bracket. He will be facing off against Morton. And of course, Sandbox and Basoto will see those four matches or those four players tomorrow. But Air Surfer stays alive and KK goes down below. Wow, what a match. It was a roller coaster of emotions. And my throat. Yeah, my, my, I my know. voice is gone. My throat is absolutely shredded after both of those matches. Rich, that was a great one. Air Surfer, that was a hard fought best of three. I can see taking deep breaths right now. So, first, let's start with how are you feeling after finishing that fight? Uh, that was a very intense best of three, and I'm pretty nervous and out of breath right now. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you went through some ups and downs. Talk to me about game number two. You took the tower on the left hand side, then the lava push broke on through, and then you had that mighty miner. What was the process there? Yeah, so he just went in with the lava, so I went all in and punished an upset lane. And then I was also able to defend because I suckled back to my mighty miner, so I thought it was pretty easy to defend that. Well, you've, you've got a bit of a rest now. You've earned it one more time. Let's hear it for Air Surfer. And who told you you couldn't get a workout while playing Clash Royale? Air Surfer getting his, in his cardio and securing $50,000 and a day three berth at our 2022 World Finals. The numbers here, 3.3 Mortar with Skelly King. We all know that deck, very, very popular for a long time. On the other side of it, KK running a drill deck that you could just not get on top of. There's so many responses. Skarmy, Skelly, Skeleton King, Snowball, so many ways. Juicy, talk me through these decks. Deck one, Air Surfer just not able to apply enough pressure, not able to protect his Archer Queen enough. Keiko, on the other hand, played very calm and collected. He makes sure to cycle stuff on defense on both lanes. He only went for a couple graveyards the entire match. Graveyards were effective while Air Surfer's Royal Hogs could not find the tower. Then we go to game number two, which had a fascinating final moments there. The Inferno Dragon of KK sneaks on through the right hand side. Air Surfer misses it with the rocket, misses it with, uh, you know, anything. Could have been a, a Goblin Barrel on defense, could have been Skellies, could have been a Fire Spirit, just not able to do it. But then the Mighty Miner plus the Barrel is just enough. And then you guys just saw it. Game number three, so many options to deal with that drill. But really, KK with the predictive cannons were phenomenal. AC, I mean, these last two, have, I mean, this whole day, this whole weekend has been absolutely amazing. What do you got for us? Well, see, I made a couple calls and I said, hey, I want to do- He did not make any no, phone I calls. No, I made a couple calls, <laughs> I made a couple calls. I said, I want to do two replays. They said no, so we're sticking with game number two. Let's get into it. Why do you why do you do this? Just it's because, the, it's it's the, just cause the person who told you no is your roommate, the God RF. <laughs> so it just makes me so happy. <laughs> All right, what do we got? Okay, so we do have a brilliant defense right there. Mighty Miner is going to come down, be able to protect the Dark Goblin, and I like that he remained aggressive. But here, this is going to be the big mistake. He utilizes that ability, not going to do anything. Oh. It hits absolutely nothing. Law comes out, and we see a great Fire Spirit in response. But he still needs to get to that Mighty. Minor. That is one of the problems with these kind of decks. You just can't cycle correctly. I am so ready to point out this second mistake because this is the one that should oh. potentially lose the game. We see it. The bomb goes off. It does not hit the Inferno Dragon. It does not push it back. And that tower does go down with 10 seconds left. 
We see the uh, Dark Goblin able to take out most of these troops. That's okay. It's okay when you have a flying machine on the board. But as we take wow. a look at the Mighty Miter, wow. Mighty Miter on top of the tower, Arrow's not going to do enough. It takes it out fully. I thought for certain he was going to need more. Not the case. Air server took game number two. Great breakdown there, AC. And the other thing about it was you saw kind of the skellies be dropped in desperation to try to protect the cannon. That's why they weren't there for the Inferno Dragon, but still Air Surfer able to come away with it. And now we have this moment, Juicy, where we have KK that has to turn right back around and go right back in the trenches against Humble Keith, who we saw struggle a little bit at the start of the day yesterday against Sandbox, but then it really seems he started to put things together at the end of his first set and all throughout his second set of the day. I've asked you this before. You have great live stage experience. You've given some very wonderful war room talks, if I may say so myself. Uh, let's take a look here at the bracket, and then you can give some advice maybe to KK on how to calm himself down. We have our upper semifinal set already. Sandbox and Basoto, Morton and Air Surfer, four of the biggest names in the game. We'll see them tomorrow. Well, they would be, be battling for that $250,000 prize. Let's take a look at our lower bracket. This is where we're staying for the rest of the day. 17, 18, 19, and 20, and then we're gonna go right into match 21 and 22. We're gonna say goodbye to six competitors over our next six matches. Juicy, anything really popping out to you on this bottom part of the bracket? I think the biggest one that pops out to me is the KK versus Humble Keith match. We are going into it right now. It's a really tough situation to be in if you are KK. You just lost. It's against you. Or just like the vibe is against of you, course. right? Of course. Yeah, the momentum. It's uh, Clash Royale is a major momentum game. And then you look here at Sweep versus Mohammed Light, Moogie versus Dominic. Now, yes, KK and Humble Keith, there are, I'd say, maybe favorites in every single one of these matches. Maybe the margin is just a little bit smaller on both sides. Uh, but Moogie and Moho is always a tough draw in an elimination matchup. Josh, I hear you've ran from here to all the way over there. What's up? Yeah, I, I made a couple calls and they just <laughs> keep rejecting what I'm asking, but that's okay. We do have a matchup between a player who just got knocked out. Will he be able to recover? Going against Keith, who is able to see all those games happen. Keith and KK. to the stage and you can see KK honestly it looks like he hasn't even played yet today I love that I'm sure the nerves are there you got to calm yourself we are going to give them a little bit of additional time to prepare their decks but of course as Juicy just intimated this is a momentum game and it is a very tough thing to turn it around and forget what just happened Rich you and I know all about this we lost a game two weeks ago that we're still thinking about yeah yeah it happens it sticks with you forever but you know you got to get rid of it you got to have what they call in baseball a pitcher's memory you give up a home run you better go out and throw strikes to the next batter and we'll see if KK can do that of course he's a veteran KK has been in this I introduced him and air surfer as OGs yep and that's absolutely true they've been here before KK can recover from this that's what he's great at the big question is really uh, how much had they put preparation in for the possible eventuality of facing Keith? Yeah, and there's also the other side of that mental conversation. You know, you go out there, you shoot your first three threes, and they maybe don't land. But after you've been out there for a while, you're warmed up, you're ready to go, you're in your element. Maybe KK is vibing right now, whereas Keith, there's the pressure of waiting. I've been waiting, I wonder who I'm gonna play. Maybe he prepared more for one because after game one, he thought, all right, maybe I'm gonna be facing Air Surfer. Air Surfer turns it around, has a great games two and three. Uh, I mean, do you have any thoughts on the mentality, or do you think it's a total coin flip at this point? I think Keith is totally fine mentality. I don't think the, the the opponent changes his mentality at all. Yeah. Either way, he's up against a giant, up against someone he probably watched play I'm sure. earlier in his career. I'm really curious about what KK is feeling right now, because KK, we just saw some mistakes, uncharacteristic ones. Can he recover? We'll find out right now. Game number one, Keith and KK. And I think impressive is one of the best ways to describe the fact that KK is ready to go. And we see Keith holding a hand up. This is the first time that this has happened in the tournament thus far. And now shaking his head. 
Yeah, that's interesting. And, and, and uh, he's, out and he's waving him off. So you talk about mental games and already maybe a little bit going in favor of KK. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, what was that hand about? We'll have to hopefully we find out later what the result was there. Either way, he's sticking it out and it just you can still see the shake in his head, the the pulls of the face, just not liking something right now. I'm so curious as to what this might be. Is this, it's not the deck that, no, okay. I was like, this isn't the deck. All right, all right, so we, we don't know. But now KK, you see misplays. I don't know what's happening, Rich. The players keep throwing their hands up in the air. They both look like they're having a rough time, but really not that much bad has happened yet. Yeah, I mean, it might just be something's got them a bit out of sorts. Of course, we'll, if there is something, we'll find out about it at the moment. Drill plus bats. A lot of damage here for Keith as we get past the opening minute. Keith, a 80% win rate with his favorite win condition being the drill on the other side of it when you look at KK and his numbers coming out with what looks like drill as well at a 75% clip. So both of them very, very excellent with this deck. And that Inferno Tower is an odd little wrench to throw in, but it's going to do good work against that Mighty Miner. Yeah, the Mighty Miner suddenly has a, a contender for the throne as someone throws CWA's tattoo out on the board. However, the cycle gets slowed down just a hair, and keeping up with those wall breakers could be tough for Keith, we'll find out. Or excuse me, for KK. And not quite. You saw what he was going for there. King Tower activation not getting done, but a little bit of fancy footwork there on behalf of Keith. Drill to the right-hand side, picked up by the Golden Knight. One back getting away, and that forced the NATO out from KK. But now he's going to be once again out of the frying pan, into the fire. Mighty Miners continuing to give trouble to our former Game With player. 16-26 here for KK in the opening bout of his elimination set. Their elimination set. And now Drill uncontested. Log does get the final goblins off the board. As we go into the final 30 of regulation, it is Keith ahead 16-0-1. To 2374. Fireball comes in, gets on top of that Golden Knight. A log comes down to clean up those goblins, but still KK is hurting in terms of damage, and he's not in a great elixir spot. NATO to make some room for the drill, but log takes care of business and this Magic Archer, again, not going to target this time, and wow. that's a couple key shots there from the Magic Archer Keith, as we go to sudden death. He's got to lock down that interaction. He's struggled with it a couple times already. Obviously, that one a lot worse than I'd say the first. Drill in as he's about to go to the side here. Nope, goes to the front this time around with a log. Perfect wow. prediction for the Spear Goblins, and the back log from Keith does not get the goblins off the board, and suddenly it's KK back in the lead. And this is not where you want to be with this Wall Breakers deck. You can see on the face of Humble Keith when it happened, but damage comes in once again for Keith. 777, lucky number there. Maybe for Keith, maybe for KK. We'll find out as these defensive Wall Breakers come down four for four. And now you see that with the Wall Breakers being played on defense, Log now out of cycle, the method he's been using to contend with the Magic Archer no longer available. You see those skellies in the back to help protect that Magic Archer a bit, but they go all the way around and now bats. But a nice fire spirit here. Wall Breakers press drill opposite direction. What does he have to stop it? He oh misses the Lord. NATO and Keith takes game number one. And this has to be tough for KK. He's played three games Back to back to back losses now. Three out of four have been L's. This is so fascinating. Again, mistakes. And to quote a guy who's in the arena, Bellican here from CRL 2018, mistakes beget mistakes. You That's make right. one, you're very likely to make another. And right now they are piling on for KK. The cascading effects of mistake in Clash Royale is something that is so difficult to get away from. Even yesterday, we saw Arden Toas when he had that mini P.E.K.K.A. The miner came up too high. Mini P.E.K.K.A. doesn't go to the center, gets three swings on the tower, and then you drop the Musketeer. You're just pouring Elixir in because you just want to stop the bleeding. Let's take a look here at the replay. A great few final moments for Humble Keep. It just felt like there were a lot of times where KK just got caught not knowing what he wanted to do. 
decision making a bit slow. And you see these skeletons here meant to defend that magic archer. But now when the log comes in, you see, look at all the expenditure happening. KK goes down relatively low, but at this point he has nothing that he would normally use against those wall breakers. Yeah. Skeletons gone, fire spirit gone. If he'd had one of those with the NATO, that damage is prevented. Instead, that commitment at the bridge left him thirsting on defense. Yeah, and I really do think that's back to the conversation of the mentality. There's really no reason to sell out at that point. There's still a good amount of game time left. You're not too far ahead or behind either competitor. And you saw Keith, he did what he needed to do. Defend on that left-hand side, look for the opening, go drill wall breakers. You know what's in and out of cycle for your opponent. And that's just kind of an uncharacteristic misplay for KK. But when you add in that extra factor of the live stage, it's hard to say that it's not on brand. Sure, that's a, that's a big question, and let's go take a look at some of the community predictions so far for this one. And most of you picking KK, of course, probably before he was down one game, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah, you know, I would assume. One of the things I want to talk about right now is you talk about mentality, the lack of expectations for Keith. Yes. I think that might be playing in here. He doesn't feel any weight of expectations. You know, he knows he's a good player, but also knows that no one thinks he's going to win this one. That has to be a freeing feeling. Yeah, that was something that we were mentioning yesterday when talking about, and I'll finish this sentence in just a moment as we hop into game. Game number two between Humble Keith and KK. You and I have said this for years, Rich. When you back a wild animal into a corner, they got nothing to lose. That's not who you want to fight. That's not who you want to run into. No, not at all. And right now, Keith is certainly fighting like that as he comes out with. The Ice Spirit plus guards to open. Bandit for KK and now Mortar opposite lane. And an MK Ram Rider deck. We'll see if Lightning is the spell of choice. This is a very interesting matchup. That Lightning can help with the AQ, can obviously help with that Mortar. But this Ram Rider should have a clear path. No, Snowball comes down last second. And don't do it, don't, don't do it, don't do it, okay. Wow, a miracle has just happened here at our 2022 World Finals. Yeah, uh, I think that Humble Keith at this point could turn water into wine with <laughs> stopping that Ram Rider from connecting. <laughs> and KK ticks to 10, gets an E-Spirit to stop. Now no King Tower activation in play. An interesting choice of Miner just right smack dab center in the front, maybe thinking, hey, you know what, if I go to the number one spot, which is the most likely here, or even number three, he's gonna have to come much further, not, not as far around with that, whatever they go for the pickup, in this case, the mini P.E.K.K.A., that center spot, maybe getting a little extra shot there. Yeah, and you never wanna go inside and to the right, just in case that snowball is able to push for the King Tower activation, so I do like that pull. And as an MK comes down in the back, and Archer Queen is on that right-hand tower. Oh my word, here oh. goes the ability, he has to spend oh something here. Oh my gosh, and what beautiful wow. patience by humble Keith to save that ability. And the Ice Spirit behind to predict on that Electro Spirit and get it done. Keith is playing the best Clash Royale of his career at the most important time in his life. And this is not the situation KK wants to find himself at this moment. But when you talk about this matchup, it does start to tilt in favor of KK as we get into double and triple elixir. But Keith does seem to be just nails right now, Rich. Archer Queen at the bridge, creating pressure. Mega Knight in response. And MK with the Ram Rider now. We should see a mortar up high potentially to turn around, and it does. But it will get hit Ooh. pretty heavily by that MK. And nothing there now at the moment. Snowball comes down, gonna need a Valkyrie. Snowball comes in, push back, and there's the Valk. And Valk will take care of business as Keith extends his lead, 1886 on the right-hand tower. And as we're getting closer to sudden death overtime, it is Keith playing the cycle deck, and we'll see what kind of stacking KK is able to do late here. And just taking his time right now is Keith taking some looks at how he wants to defend, this time not trying to go pressure. And this is some maturity out of Keith playing the low defensive mortar rather than trying to always force the issue up high. Yeah, and I like that. He's got a pretty good way to get back around in terms of creating enough offensive pressure to where his opponent can't just sell out push and then being able to get around to a mortar again. But he also has great responses with that ice spirit, with that snowball. He's able to really control the game. Ice spirit there just to buy the AQ a bit more time and keep the bandit off there as 
The Ooh. Valkyrie moves forward quite nicely to cover. And that mini P.E.K.K.A. is a mistake there from K.K. Maybe looking for the A.Q., but it goes to the Valk. A.Q. is still alive. This three-card cycle has been a part of this matchup for maybe 30 seconds now. Bandit oh, does pick wow. up, but the Miner to the back. Either way, now that means Miner with some extra damage there. No, a pickup from the mini P.E.K.K.A. Kind of hiding behind the tower there. And this is a nice little set of guards to deal with the mini P.E.K.K.A. from K.K. As they sit back, reset, and KK goes Mega Knight in the back. 1198. 1198 HP separate KK from being eliminated or moving on. Top 10 ladder finish, the previous maybe best achievement of Chief of Keefe's or whatever, Chief Keefe, Humble Keefe, Keefe, whatever he is now. <laughs> Probably the biggest achievement of his career up until this point. Making it through here would be possibly the crowning moment. And this could be a scary little push coming through on that right-hand side. MK plus Mini P.E.K.K.A. Ram Rider still will not connect. Those guards, the DPS from the guards are so under-celebrated, but so incredibly effective. But Keith having to spend a lot here to defend against what he's got in front of him. And now the Ram Rider to the left-hand side. Mortar should be back in cycle, able to hold on to it. KK trying to put pressure on, oh, fighting for wow. his World Finals life. It's not looking like he can do it. And it looks like KK will be the first player eliminated on our day two. $30,000 in the bank and a good luck. See you next year, my friend. And what a win for Keefe after a first round exit at World Finals last year. One of the lower ranked players this year. Now he's gone through one, through two, guaranteed himself $40,000 and a significant position in 2022. One of the guys to really look out for there in the world. And you talk about that experience, Rich. It's come in such a short amount of time. This level of live stage audience, pyrotechnics, casters in the room, crowd in the room. It's so much, and he seems so incredibly mature. He's been very calm the entire way through this, so let's go ahead and see how he's feeling right now. Josh, what do you got for us? In game, in game number two, only one snowball, only one e-spirit was able to hit the tower. Do you believe that this is the best Clash Royale in your entire life? Nel gioco 2 è solo una snowball e uno spiritello e sono andati, devono andare a torre. Ci credi che questo è il tuo miglior gioco di Clash Royale in assoluto? Fino ad ora, senza dubbi, questo è stato il mio game perfetto. Without any doubts, this is the best match that I ever played in my life. I love hearing that on the biggest stage. He is able to perform back to the casters. I mean, what a performance indeed from Keith. Yeah, you know, we, we keep on talking about it, but this is a guy who people said shouldn't have been at World Finals right. last year. Uh, a guy people said the same thing again this year, and here he is playing brilliant Clash Royale. And he's proving all of his naysayers wrong. And yes, brilliant is really the only way to put it. And as he said, he just played the best set of his life in the most important moment of his career. And that extends his run here in World Finals. Let's take a look at the decks that we just saw. Only two of them, because Keith dominated and this match number one it's it's the mighty miner really giving fits and starts for kk two matches in a row and of course a quick turnaround the mighty miner was huge but then of course it was that drill wall breakers push kk trying to win the bridge fight couldn't get it done and the pressure on the right hand side just finished the matchup and then if we take a look at deck number two here man you know the you have some tools for kk here but too much given up too early and keith just ran away with it and you look at the ability to control the mega knight with the valkyrie able to control the bandit plus the mini pekka with the guards and then get a counter push or at least deal with the ram rider that comes down ice spirit mortar and snowball that is not what you want to see juicy jackson wall What's up? How you feeling? What do you got for us? There's not too much to go over, but I want to go over this last defense from Keith. He played it perfectly. Like you said, he's got so many options. The Mortar, Valk, Guards, Ice Spirit, Snowball, even the Miner on defense in yeah. some situations. Let's hop straight into it. And trying to get that I play started here so we can take a look at it. And maybe a little bit of a, uh, we'll take a moment, see if we can re fix that replay there in just Rejigger, a second. Rejigger, I believe. Yeah, we can just like, just, I don't know, shake it a little bit, see what happens. There. Blow it, take it out and blow it. All right, it. we got it going. There Let's hop go. over All the right. Telestrator here. Juicy's got it for us. All righty, here we go. 
Snowball misses, doesn't matter. He's got the Ice Spirit for the Ram Rider on the right side. He's got the Valkyrie. Huge push, it looks scary, but the Mortar's up. It's really healthy. Valkyrie, the poison just to make sure. Arch Queen, the bridge at this point. Miner already took out most of the Mega Knights. That's gonna be basically it for the defense. There really isn't much else to be said with this one. Beautiful gameplay from Keef. Yeah. Shut down defense all the way through and a great performance by Keith. But of course, that's just one of our eliminations so far. A few more to go for our next elimination match. Joshua Sharon, what do we got? The reigning champion. We need him to keep on playing. But I think the player he's going against is going to try and stop it. We have Dominic, aka Doom, and Moogie. Those quick turnarounds, Andrew. Yeah. We just saw a big one there for KK. You know, Dom has been preparing exclusively for one of two options, either one of the top three greatest players in the game or one of the other top three greatest players in the game. Moogie, you gotta wonder, like, how much focus did he have on Dom for this matchup? I mean, uh, it's one of those things where it's, I wonder if he leaned into his own predictions out there and go, I need to over-prepare for the guy that I really think is gonna lose. And who knows who he decided? Who knows if he prepared for Morton? Because Moogie is technically still the favorite. In my mind, he is our reigning, defending world champion, but then when you say that sentence and then you add in the fact that our reigning defending world champion could be gone in 15 minutes of gameplay. That's crazy, or potentially in six, right? This could be just get it done in three, right. get it done in three, adios, we'll see you next year, but that's, uh, that's up to him to solve that problem, especially against a guy, Doom, who has already shown some high unpredictability. We'll talk about that more in a minute. First, let's jump into game number one. Or, and, or we'll hang out here for a little while, as opposed to going to game number one. Uh, I would, actually, that was us trying to make a living photograph for you guys. Yeah, we've actually been practicing that since 2018, 2019. Uh, we got a lot of good ones in there. We like to just freeze for a minute and let you guys think your internet is buffering. It's just a fun thing we do up here. No one likes it but us. In my spare time, I work at the pier as one of those uh, living statues, paint myself in silver and every once in a while go hee hee and then try to get an extra dollar from you. So as we see the stage, you guys can see right here behind me, it looks like Dom is sitting talking to an admin and this is probably the last thing in the world that he wants. After yesterday, as you can see, maybe talking about something with his deck, something with the device, who knows, but it should be sorted out in just a minute. And especially, like I just said, after his day yesterday, it's so very important that we make sure everything is in place for Dominic. Yeah, certainly a challenge, but I want to talk about how he recovered from that because he had that game where there was the unfortunate missed call yes. about the repeated card, came back and the L came in, and that was, we'll talk about that crazy deck in a minute he had prepared for yeah. it. But then he bounced back really well in that first lower bracket match and seemed like he recovered very quickly and that speaks volumes for mentality, even with being that upset. That was one of the things that I was actually going to say at the end of the show. You know, we get that beautiful moment at the end where we're all going to talk about our favorite moments of the day, and it does feel really tough for Dominic to drop that first set, so it did feel appropriate that he was able to continue on into day two. Now, hopefully, the cards are reset. The table is reset. Let's take a look here at the community predictions for this matchup. I feel they're going to be very heavily weighted, maybe the most heavily weighted community matchup uh, numbers that we'll see. 82% to 18%. Uh, how do you feel about those numbers? They actually don't feel crazy to me, even though I wouldn't be surprised if an upset did happen. I mean, that, actually, I would be surprised. That feels about right. It would, it would be a, su a surprise upset to have Mookie out this early yes. at World Finals. Um, I think that Japan woke up and started doing all of their predictions because, of course, there's a rabid <laughs> yes. scene for Clash Royale there, the home of our first World Finals in CRL. And, uh, One of the best of course, tricks of my life. Oh, Just want to throw that in there. Yeah, I mean, it gave me a ramen addiction for sure. I can't stop <laughs> eating it. And uh, you got to imagine that's a big force behind Mugi, of course. If you haven't made predictions for our first two days, make sure you go to event.clashrail.com to get your predictions in for day three, win rewards. And of course, if you're watching anywhere, you can watch there and experience all of Clash Fest at that website. All right, here we go. The stage is set. You already got your predictions in. Let's go, Moogie and Dominic. Will we see any of the weird dexmanship out of Doom oh, that we saw you yesterday? You use it more than me now, and I'm so sad about it. Yeah, well, it just it's <laughs> it's almost just like a little call out for you. Really. It is. It does. It makes me happy every time. And what we're talking about is the uh, the strange lava hoggy Q deck 
that Dominic ran yesterday. Didn't get to have that surprise factor, so we'll see if he has anything else up his sleeve here. And that was a deck he pulled out against an outmatched opponent. I mean, try to think of a, a more of an outmatched opponent situation than playing Moot. Absolutely, and uh, Match Roger comes down in the back here for Dominic. Flying Machine should actually get on top of the tower. There we go, Golden Knight comes down just in time. Looking like it could be some version of Drill. There's also a weird, yep, there we go. I'm so glad I stopped talking. And looking like Lava Hound here for Moogie. And going with the, yeah, and Lava, wow, aggressive high Lava to turn the Archer away and, and get the Skeleton Dragons on it. Perfect play there by Moogie. And now a little bit late against the Cannon Cart, taking the damage on the right-hand side, so. Nice damage from Dom, but that left-hand tower is in a world of hurt as he just has to wait for that elixir to collect like a lake repopulating after a drought. It makes sense there that Dom goes opposite lane with a cannon immediately, and I think Moogie actually was trying to push that cannon cart back with the miner. I believe that can happen, but Dom getting uh, uh, his favorite win condition kind of thrown in his face by our world champion. Dom does have a great win rate with Drill, and Moogie here decides to come out with Lava. Dom has played Lava 37 times in his competitive career, but you never know. If those mirror matchups you're playing against your favorite win condition is can be very tough sometimes. Certainly difficult, especially with the bridge fight he's about to get into right now. Moogie just keeping some pressure on and down to two, so he's gonna sit and let this one die on the vine, but take a little bit extra damage from that right-hand tower as we go into our final minute of regulation play. Moogie does have the left-hand tower of Doom down, and. Doom has a lot of work to do. Big shout out there to Alpi for all of these incredible numbers. One of the things that really stands out to me here is that Moogie has run Lava twice in competitive, excluding this weekend with a 0% win rate. So maybe being as unpredictable as possible is our reigning world champion. He was plus Magic Archer now to work against the Lava Hound, the Bar Barrel, not quite there in time to save the Magic Archer, but a nice NATO on defense. So defense finally coming together, but maybe a little bit too late. And now the GG coming out as the onslaught pours down the hill. And Doom knows it's over, just has to regroup, reset, and get ready to fight back in game number two. I did love the barrel that came out from Dominic there. He was able to distract one of the Skeleton Dragons, then Nato's it all away, but just not able to get enough in on this heavy lava deck. You talk about the damage that you have with the uh, Magic Archer and the Electro Wizard in terms of the units that you need to clear off the board, and Dom just needed a little bit more spell power. But when you look at Moogie and you see that he's only ran lava twice in his competitive career in 2022, Two with a 0% win rate, that's tough. It's tough to think he's gonna come out with that. Yeah, but that's again when you talk about the greats making those choices in those moments. And there's a lot of players who that deck pool is shallow. They can't yes. get outside of a four or five deck range. But one of the things you talk about with Moogie having worked with Tight for so long is they've really worked on depth. And Moogie's a guy who can play anything. He doesn't always do it, but that capability runs deep. We just saw that right there. Let's take a look here at the replay. This is the first time that Dominic and Moogie have met this year. And this is it. You see that Moogie's going to go all in on that left-hand side with that high Lava Hound. He recognizes that Magic Archer is now out of cycle. He knows the only other option he has is a NATO plus an Ewis. So Dom goes aggressive on the right-hand lane. He's not able to push that cannon cart back. Maybe someone on Twitter can yell at me if that's not a real interaction, but I'm pretty sure it is. <laughs> Miner comes down, gets the cannon cart off the board. Only 1780 remains. And it really does feel, you see there, Dominic looked up for a split second. He knew at that point, his fate was sealed. Yeah, that was, a, that was a rough moment for him. And now we get into the question because last time out when he was down one, he turned to a Lava Hound deck in game number two, Ultra Comfort. And I have to think that going Lava here in game two from Doom would spell his doom. I mean, it's one of those things where he was leaning on the surprise factor for that Lava Hog deck. What if he does it again right now? What would be more surprising than Doom running Lava Hog Rider three times in two days when two of them really did not go his way? He lost this I mean, that's really the only way to put it. We heard him talking about it. You win with that by only surprising them. You know, especially in this matchup yesterday, if the NATO's out of cycle and there's not a good DPS card down, the Lava tanks for that Hog Rider, and maybe it's GG just that easily. You said it's seven hits with a Hog Rider naked, but if you have a Lava Hound tanking for it, that changes the story a that, little bit. That does change that math significantly, of course, and that's the big question now, because if Moogie sees Lava Hound, He's not, he remembers, he knows that deck from yesterday. I think he'll make sure he's a bit more conservative, but of course, only one way to find out. Game two, let's go.
Good luck in both directions. And if you're just joining us, Dominic on the bottom of our screen, down one game, Moogie at the top, up one game, but still in our elimination bracket. And now we have both of our top two players from 2021 in an elimination situation on day two. And Moogie with Spears Log and Fire Spirit to open up. So some quick cycle play, possibly a bait variant here. Could be a Mighty Miner Mortar deck. Well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna guess mortar always and just hope it happens. Mortar miner and it's drill instead. I was gonna say mortar miner is one of Moogie's best decks, his original one trick, but doesn't really play it a lot. And on the other side of it, we have Dominic's giant skeleton working down that left hand lane. Yeah, Dom does run this RG deck quite a bit. Usually the giant skeleton queen variation or. Alternatively, the Skeleton King variation. And a lot going on with not a whole lot of damage done. You can see there Dom wiping his hands up by just a hair at 44 HP in the, in the, in the black, if you will. And just a little extra pressure here does force out the Queen. Just trying to make Dominic make moves is Moogie. And the biggest thing about that is making moves so that your opponent makes mistakes. Moogie clearly has. I mean, Moogie looks incredibly dialed in where I can see Dom looking around the room, looking at his phone, wiping his hands. Obviously, a lot more on the line after dropping game number one. Well, especially looking at this, right? He has to break through Mighty Miner Cannon Log with this Royal Giant deck. And of course, that Mighty Miner can go ahead and defend this Giant Skeleton and then switch lanes as well. Fishman will change that tune a little bit. And that's the biggest thing here for Dom, is he just needs to slow play it. Well, never mind. He's going to go in. Giant Skeleton tanking for this Royal Giant right behind the drill. Probably going to come out defensively here. Great play there by Moogie. We'll see if he gets right back around to something else, or if he's going to take one shot. Wow. Wow. Just brilliance. And that's another piece of this, too, is the defensive drill can just play shut down. Shut down defense. So now the question is, what does Moogie do to create offense? Is it just little things like this? This is significant chip damage from those Spear Goblins. And you saw Dom look up right when it happened. He puts the Giant Skeleton down in the back. Spear Goblins cross the bridge, and another small mistake there for Dominic, who cannot afford them at this point in his run at CRL 2022. Two Giant Skeletons on the board. Bats working on one on the left with the Fire Spear trying to protect that cannon, but that cannon is going to go down, I believe, here. And now Royal Giant has a bit of a clear path Fireball to disrupt the support. Back to another cannon is moved. Great placement there on the cannon log to come in just in time. Bats getting so much value. And Dominic, while he is trying, he gives out the well played to his opponent because he cannot figure out a way to get through. And Moogie knows it. Moogie's just playing brilliant. Look, we just saw a phenomenal match between Moogie and Morton. And that's one where you almost say neither one of them lost with the brilliance we saw. And now someone does have to go down. That was Moogie, but he's still playing. Just the 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 micro is it, Yes, I mean, that is really the only way to put it. Chef's kiss, he's always like that. The two guys with the greatest micro in the game are both in our lower bracket in Mohammed Light and Moogie. But it is poetry in motion to watch them play, whether it's defensive or offensive. But this game has been all about the shutdown D from Moogie. Doom is going to have to find some way to make an outlandish prediction, I think. We've seen some of those cycle cards played at the bridge on defense, the bats, something like that. He needs to figure out how to get the Ice Spirit involved, somehow find a way to kind of disrupt these defenses uh, and, and be a little bit less predictable. I think it's so tough because I think that last card most likely is Lightning, which he just cannot get on top of anything. And even Lightning, the Mighty Miner, it just is, it resets it, but it doesn't take it off the board. And then the fact that he can play the drill and then the cannon behind, it's just so difficult for Dom to create space. This is the push, 40 seconds remain. Will Dominic be eliminated or will Moogie be upset? A very nice pull on the Mighty Miner, but RG just cannot break past these cannons. Archer Queen is still up, Fire Spirit to defend, and Bats just holding this right at the bridge. And Doom lightnings the King Tower, takes off his headset, and just has to give it up to one of the greats of all time. Moogie bounces back with a clean 2 up And that's exactly what Moogie needs to ride that confidence into day three. He's safe for now. Actually, technically, he's got another one coming in a little bit. So Moogie eliminates Dom and is now in a great spot mentally here. Dominic, 
Adios, great job, 30K. Maybe we'll see you again next year, my friend. Yeah, you know, we always do have next year, but what we have right in front of us now is one of the most dangerous players in the game staying alive. I heard a lot of talk that if you lost earlier in the day, it would be impossible to recover, but he is different. How were you able to do that? ま、well, when your best is that good, it kind of makes sense. Back to the casters. Thanks a lot, Josh, and that was some of Moogie's best. Of course, he's been giving us a lot of great moments so far today. Uh, Jackson, Dominic had to do a, a, a big recovery there, but it's Moogie at the quick turnaround. You've had, been in a situation to create decks quickly. I mean, I mean, do you just go with a, a pre-planned situation? What's the call there when you're trying to do it so fast? Honestly, you have to go with it on the fly, so a lot of the time it is going to be pre-selected. If you are going to be making changes, it's going to be very minimal changes as you respond to how your opponent's first games go. Let's take a look at the decks from that one, because this was a key couple of matchups. Dom finding himself against Lava Hound, his favorite here early on, and we saw some brilliant play in the left-hand lane early as it was Moogie playing the Lava Hound up high to turn the Magic Archer away from the, from the, the Skeleton Dragons and a big-time push. Second deck here, Giant Skelly RG versus Drill. Mugi did a great job of pressuring both lanes and focusing on very solid defense with the Cannon and the Mighty Miner. This was a really phenomenal performance from Mugi, and Dominic does leave now. $30,000 did up that from the 20K, so stays in the mix. But now we're into this point where not only is elimination on the line, but every single match starts to up those stakes a whole bunch. You win here, it's getting yourself to 40K. Win the next one up to 50K, and then we start getting into that big money, trying to shoot for that big quarter million dollar prize. 65K, 80K, 125K, and then doubling that to the $250,000 grand prize. These elimination matches keep on coming. We have two more elimination matches left. And of course, uh, we'll have one of our big ones coming up next. We've already seen Moogie stay safe. We've seen Morton get all the way through down to the end. And of course, Morton now, one of those guys, you talk about Morton, talk about Air Surfer, those guys who've made it all the way through Sandbox as well. They are only three wins away from a world championship. Whereas the guys we're looking at right now, they have to, to win, I believe six matches at this point, try to take home that crown. Yeah, and that's a lot of mental stress. It might not seem like it, it is just a phone game, but each match, each best of three, puts a lot of stress on your mental, but also you are revealing your decks and your preparation the more matches you play. And that's actually a really key factor, right? Is that, you know, you, you, you do so much depth, so much preparation, but the guys sitting back, everyone who won earlier today, they're done for the day. They just sit back, they prepare for a couple of matches, they watch these guys, and they get more and more information. And you talk about some of the great minds in analysis right now. Some of the guys supporting these players, you have Tight, you have Julesy, you have Jebus, you have Winwoo, you know those guys are making those notes right now, getting ready for the big matchups. Speaking of big matchups, we got another one coming your way right now. Andrew, take us away. One of these players fell a little short earlier today in the Battle of Brazil. The other is the pride of Portugal, Lucas X Gamer and Vitor 75. Vitor75 and Lucas X Gamer, the battle of all teammates. You see the close hug, you have to love seeing that. Yeah, it's not as much good sportsmanship like that. Usually they're just staring each other down or just not acknowledging each other at all. Heading into some stats here 85% win rate from Vitor, 55 from Lucas. You know, it's kind of cool looking at those win rates because when you look at that right off the bat, you're saying, oh, Vitor, 85% win rate, Luke is 55. But the difference is you're looking at, you know, the stages. You're looking at the 20 wins, stage one, stage two, stage three. Lucas was able to qualify through the golden ticket, and that's why the win rate is going to be a little bit lower. Absolutely, a lot more chances to get some nice wins as you go through the other qualifier from Vitor there. 
So I want to take a look at the earlier games played. Lucas, he ran the Inferno Dragon Graveyard, and then game number two, he ran Lava. He got some pretty weird matchups. Game number two, I think he really did get hard countered. Game number one, it was kind of a weird thing. I actually saw his Twitter, and he talked about his cycle. It looked like it was kind of a weird start to the game, and he said he didn't have the uh, Tornado at the beginning of the game. That'll do it. You need that Tornado. A lot of the time in matches like this in Clash Royale, decks matter a lot, but your starting hands matter even more in certain situations. If you don't have a main defensive card like the Tornado or building like the Cannon, sometimes you'll get in a spot where it's just un it's impossible to win against a really good player. Okay, well, let's see this game. I can't wait to see. Heading into game number one, the first player that uh, that was knocked out in an earlier round but was still able to play a second time today lost his match. Moogie, on the other hand, was able to recover. It's going to be interesting to see if it's going to be Lucas able to get the victory or if it's going to be another defeat. Lucas starting off pretty nicely. He's got a minor cycle deck versus a bait. That's definitely a solid matchup. As long as you have a log for that Golem Barrel, you're definitely going to be in a good situation. Yeah, oftentimes with the Miner, we do see the Quick Cycle accompanied by it. So we see the Ice Spirit, we see the Poison. It's going to be either a log or a delivery. We've seen a few different variations throughout this tournament. It is a roll delivery. That's going to make a bit of a difference if Vitor is able to outcycle, which definitely he will later on the line since Lucas is using guards instead of skeletons. Lucas is just not going to be able to get that roll delivery down in time to stop the goblins. Yeah, we saw it in uh, Moogie's game against Morton where he had the log, he had the delivery, and he still wasn't able to recover. What did Morton say? He was saying that like he had the matchup, right? If, I mean, he did say that once again. I think he was like majorly modest because he had so many counters for that Goblin Barrel. But you are right, with the three card cycle, he's able to outcycle the log, and then Moogie just wasn't quick enough with those roll deliveries. We'll see if that seems to be the case here in this match with Lucas. Mighty Miner not able to predict. A lot of the other cards, you know, they kind of just walk over quickly. The Mighty Miner does take his time. Kind of unfortunate, and it's kind of one of those situations where Mighty Miner, you could arguably say that you should play the Mighty Miner just delayed, just on top of the Miner, and it's one of the only cards where you can even make that argument. Absolutely. Goblin Barrel getting so much damage here on this left-hand side with that roll delivery out of cycle. Interesting idea from Lucas to use the roll delivery on the Dark Goblin. I feel like that's just not your priority when we're talking about use of the roll delivery in this match. So 740 HP separating the two players. Vitor on the bottom does have the rocket, and he's going to use the rocket on the Archer Queen. I love that he's not trying to get too aggressive. He's not trying to spell cycle just yet. He understands how to play the matchup, and that's exactly what you want. You can play the rocket whenever the Archer Queen is out on the board. The other big thing about that is he negates his opponent's ability to have a three-card cycle while placing his Mighty Miner to activate his own. And now he's going to be cycling Goblin Barrels to to the ends of the earth to try and get some major connections. Yeah, that's actually a phenomenal point. I didn't even register that it's a three-card cycle versus a four-card cycle when you always have that rocket in hand. I mean, he's just going to be able to get to it every single time so quickly. Dark Goblin on top of the minor, misplayed skellies. This could spell a little bit of trouble. The game does get a little bit closer, but now this is where the Fire Spirit plus the Goblin Barrel, and that is going wow. to get some chip. 1053, 900 HP separating, and Vitor is playing a phenomenal game number one. Super nice gameplay from Vitor, like you said. And then on the defense, look how solid it is. Just Bomb Tower, Rocket the Queen, make sure there's no problems. Miner gets one hit, maybe a little Poison Chip, but he just needs to get this tower into two Rocket range, get that Mighty Miner down, and use that three card, three card cycle to get that win. I love these Fire Spirit plus Goblin Barrels. Actually, I think it's Goblin Barrel plus Fire Spirit interactions from Vitor. It's just going so aggressive onto the tower. Does he have enough elixir where he can Ice Spirit, then delivery, or delivery and catch everything? And usually the answer is no. We do see Fire Spirit plus Goblin Barrel. Ice Spirit will be able to connect. That's a great defense. I mean, he didn't really have the right cards. And then there we go. Guards on defense against the Mighty Miner. You make a really, really good point about the Fire Spirit Plus, or the Goblin Barrel Plus Fire Spirit combo. Not only does it apply a lot of pressure with the Fire Spirit potentially always being able to connect, but you also cycle back to that Goblin Barrel extremely quickly when you're using the cycle card after placing your win condition. 
triple elixir underway. We do see the Mighty Miner plus the, and this is one of those fantastic pushes. These Dark Almonds, I, I, I will change the way I play Dark Almond now because these Dark Almonds from all these players, you see how much value you can get, especially when triple elixir is happening. Very, very close match all of a sudden. I think Vitor needs to start rocket cycling. Maybe not. Goblins oh. are going to connect right now. Okay, there we go. 399 just has to get the rocket down. Should be game over. And there it is. Vitor 75 taking game number one. A phenomenal game overall. It, 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 I mean, Lucas was able to recover, but just not in time. It, it, was it like a poor start? Or how, how, did, it, how did that happen? Biggest thing there was the difference in the cycle. San, or Vitor was able to constantly outcycle his opponents, and sometimes that's okay if you're on Lucas's side, if you have a Fire Spirit, because you can use a Fire Spirit push to take out that Goblin Barrel, but in this situation, the Ice Spirit is just not able to do enough. Yeah, and one thing I really liked about Lucas's gameplay in game number one, he was using the Archer Queen at the bridge. He was doing whatever he could. And that's actually how, you know, that's one of those other reasons why he was able to get back in the game. A lot of other players wouldn't have made that adjustment. And because of that, he was able to get the Miners on the tower, the Miner plus Poison when he only had Skeletons in hand because the Mighty Miner was always used on the Giant Skeleton. Even though he lost, I feel like Lucas played a great game. He really did. It was a lot closer than I thought it would be. He also did a great job of baiting out those rockets always with the Archer Queen and always preventing Vitor from going for the rocket onto the weak side tower. So I want to take a look at the community predictions. Let's see how it's going. Lucas X Gamer with 61% of the votes, 39% going to Vitor. Vitor trying to, uh, to prove the community wrong. And, uh, you know, I like that. You know, I, you know, just because you're, you're not predicted to win, you still should try. You're one step closer after that game right there. If he wants to continue on to get that victory, he's going to be having to think about this next match. We got bait out, we got Miner out. What are you thinking we're gonna be seeing from these players in the game <sighs> two? So we have Miner out, bait out. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I don't, I, I guess I, I don't like the Inferno Dragon Graveyard mm. decks, you know, the tanky control decks. I, I, for Lucas specifically, I just want to see Cycle. Whether, you know, whatever's out is out, but, you know, there's still another 20 cards that work for these Cycle decks, so I want to see Cycle from Lucas. On the other hand, Vitor, he had a great game, number one. It looks like he's ready, he's composed. We, we saw this in yesterday's matches. He, he isn't smiling, he's just ready, he has his deck set up, and he's just winning in those game two and game three situations. Looks like we are ready for the match. Let's hop straight into it. And we will see who's gonna take this victory. And maybe, just maybe, Lucas will force it to a game three. Let's see, let's hope. I, uh, I wouldn't mind a game number three for, you know, the first time we're casting on uh, the casting desk. Good luck from both sides. Miner from Vitor. Lucas picking up that Miner quite nicely with the Ghost plus E-Spirit. Zero damage taken. And maybe, just maybe Vitor is kind of copying his opponent's deck here after seeing this Miner plus delivery combo. You know what? I, uh, I don't know. I feel like I must have seen that interaction somewhere. But it, it just kind of makes me happy to defend with a Ghost on a Miner and still receive zero damage. It's just not really something I get to see very often. That is actually exactly what I was thinking. I'm not gonna lie. It's really fascinating how he was able to defend for just one more elixir, but have a very nice counter push. Forcing out that roll delivery. Giant Skelly in the back from Vitor, so it's not going to be a mirror matchup. Once again, I'm always confused to see the roll delivery and the Giant Skeleton paired together. I feel like they kind of do the same thing at blocking a lane. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. It's just, it, it, I mean, they, they work together, but maybe it's just because they're a little, you, you can't go fast enough. So if you have two different cards that kind of do the same thing, well, if one's out of cycle, you just can use the other. That's actually a really good point. Lucas trying to get a King to activation versus that Miner, but Fisherman placed one tile too far to his left. Roll Delivery gonna come down and get a very nice value taking out that Fisherman and E-Spirit here on the right. And a little baby counter push. How does Lucas want to defend? The Skellies over the middle will stop the Royal Recruit. So Lucas isn't going full cycle like I hoped, 
but uh but enough of a cycle where i can still be happy the rg lightning skelly's e-spirit will just have i mean yeah just have that quick cycle but without the champion i it, it could have been faster I'm, I'm, I'm still okay with it though absolutely rg is actually lucas's most used win condition in clash Royale league this year he only has a 54 percent win rate Queen gonna drop here on this Hunter and a bit of counter push for Vitor. Will need to defend it. E-Spirit over the bridge, going to defend it perfectly. Archer Queen will pop its invisibility. The I-Spirit will be able to help out the Archer Queen. So a very valuable Archer Queen takes out the Ghost, most of the Fishermen, the Skellies, everything and everywhere. And uh, just a great reset from both players. Another giant Skelly in the back to match that RG in the back. Lucas trying to find a way to break through in this match is going to be difficult since Vitor has such great defensive options. Like you talked about before, having that roll delivery and giant skeleton is going to be very useful for those dual lane and double RG attacks. Yeah, the giant skeleton, the guards, the ice spirit delivery, I mean, and the cannon. You have five cards that are actually solid defenses. I mean, ice spirit is kind of weird to say it's a solid defense, but really it is a solid defense against it. And that is a beautiful activation. The ice spirit is played terribly though. One tile too much. In in the middle and it's going to hit the arch queen entirely that was a huge mistake from vitor another mistake from vitor was on that right hand side he played his giant skelly too far low and that ghost is actually able to connect for quite a bit of damage luca's going to take that damage lead now a great spot to reset giant skeleton will be able to have its bomb take out most of the fishermen but not entirely giant skeleton cycled in the back behind the right side and we are just going to see aggressive defense on the left minor plus high spear plus cannon and probably the guards as well and there we go we do see them place down lucas trying to get that pre-log onto the guards with vitor delaying it just enough a bit of mind games there in order to prevent that prediction and have a very solid defense so we have a minute, 15 seconds left, 300 HP separate in the Queen. two players. And right there, Archer Queen does get two shots, 100 HP separate in the two players, but now Vitor has the lead. Who do you think has the advantage in these waning seconds? A lot of the time with minor control, you want to have a much larger damage lead by this point. Lucas is going to be heading into Triple Elixir, be able to spam RGs, spam Lightnings on both sides. It could be difficult if Vitor can't have perfect defense. Yeah, and one of my favorite things about the champions being, and this might push it, I think no. it's an opportunity to push no. it, and it does. RG gets to the tower, Glob will come down, and that is going to be two shots, tower down to 1585. Huge advantage for Lucas in these seconds. Vitor's own giant skeleton preventing himself from having a clean defense, pushing that RG away. And now we're seeing some spell cycle come through, but Lightning does more damage than Poison. It's going to be very difficult if Vitor wants to come back in this match. Defensive RG on top of the Archer Queen, not something we often get to see. I think earlier in the today, we were able to witness some hogs on defense. Ghost will be able to take out the Archer Queen. Miner going to town, not going to matter. 10 seconds left. Two giant skellies, guards, he's spamming everything, but look at this RG kite from Lucas. He calls the good game. He knows that all he has to do is stall out. One more lightning to secure it. Good game, and we're going to a game three. A phenomenal game from Lucas. Just, he got the damage that he needed. It, it, and I mean, you were talking about it. It's so hard to catch up when you're those minor players. It really is. When you are in a situation like that with a minor, you want to be at least in a thousand HP damage lead by the time you get into that triple elixir time. You could see the amount of pressure that Lucas was able to apply. But most of all, it was insane how that giant skeleton, once again, his own giant skeleton, yep. pushing that RG away from his cannon. Yeah, I was so excited to call that out. It's just not one of those things you witness that often. And it's one of those reasons why, you know, I kind of like you know, hovering the cannon on the wrong side of the path. The Tesla sure. kind of one tile too far into the middle because those interactions do happen and it is so dangerous when it occurs. The other way you can really prevent that is make sure your giant skeleton is placed as far to, to the right, far to the edge of the map yes. as possible. But just a slight miscalculation there from Vitor and that's going to be a very costly interaction. Yeah, that's one of those tips that I picked up from the pros, not just now, I learned it early on, but it was uh, when the <laughs> Magic Archer first became a thing, and then, you know, if it's going on the inside tile, you just place it on the outside, because if you make a mistake, it's not going to hit the Crown Tower, and then vice versa. So I would have liked to see that with the Giant Skeleton, unfortunately, pushes it away, and we are heading into a game number three. So we have Miner vs. RG, earlier matchup was 
Miner versus Bait. A lot of quick cycle used. Do both of these players use quick cycle, control, beat down? What do you got for me? My prediction is Vitor is going to be going to Comfort Drill. He has a 67% win rate. It's not great, but he is his most used deck for Lucas. He's already used RG. He's already used Mortar, I believe. Now he's in a situation I would not be surprised to see Drill or Hog Rider. A little bit more Comfort. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a mirror matchup in this game three. Yeah, I, I I think out of all the players in the game, uh, Lucas might be my favorite player to watch when it's a mirror match. I, I think he's so skilled. I've been watching all of his games throughout this final, uh, you know, throughout this week coming up to this event. And I mean, it is just so exciting to watch him play. It, it feels like he has an advantage when it's kind of similar, but that's enough about me. That's enough about Lucas and our great, great bond. We're heading into game number three. Game number three. I'm a little bit selfish. I saw the spectate. I just wanted them to click it faster. I, I, I think it was like six seconds instead of the normal three. And uh, <laughs> that's just too long for me to wait. Vitor with the wall breakers in the back. We're seeing more and more players do this instead of directing at the bridge. They have time to react to their opponent's play. Or in this situation, forcing Lucas to leak a bit of elixir at the start of this game. Yeah, it's one of those plays where I know it's the correct one, but I'm never going to implement that in my own gameplay. I just want to see a lot of cards on the board. I think, yeah, you know what? I, I really do believe I have ADHD. <laughs> Vitor with the Mega Knight on defense here. Lucas, I'm not sure what deck this is. Maybe a Mega Knight deck of his himself. What's uh, happening? Yeah, he does not have the correct cycle. This is a mini P.E.K.K.A. and a Mega Knight on top of the tower. Lucas just tanking it, and we're not seeing any response from Lucas on his face. He just didn't have the right cards right there. Wow. Mega Knight finally going to come down on the defense. Maybe it was in the cycle earlier. And already, Vitor has an entire tower and some on the left and some of the king. Lucas is going to try and counter push. I don't even know what to say. Yeah, I don't think it's going to matter. The bats are in cycle. Inferno Dragon locking onto the wrong card. Mega Knight will get the tower down to about 1,800. Will it get the last shot? The it drill? The What's drill. happening? Vitor doesn't What's have happening? answer. Can he push it? Oh, you see the zap. OK. Oh. OK, OK. Everybody calm down. Not going to happen again. I thought it was going to happen again. I was not calm. Fortunately, zap does come out. And Lucas is not going to be making that crazy comeback quite yet. Ram Rider here, Mini Pack is going to clean this up very nicely, though. That feels like a frustration Ram Rider, and we see it on his face. Obviously, he is frustrated. The Musketeer still had the potential to shoot it. That way, it would help out the Mini Pekka. No shots on the tower. 1734, and just by his face, you can tell he has no idea how to make this even a game. And everything's going wrong. That Mini Pekka on the right hand side going to get that final smack, take out the entire Electro Wizard as well. Lucas is not only down so much damage, a tower, but he's also down some Elixir in this situation. Vitor using one of my favorite decks in the game in its entirety of this Clash Royale uh, you know, game in general. Uh, I just like the Prince instead of the Mini Pekka. The Mini Pekka, though, because it is quicker, that's the reason why we're seeing it in these decks. And it is so good against these Ram Riders. Right there, Ram Rider going to come down. Mini Pekka going to help out. And this is just too simple, too easy. And wait a second, that is a Ram Rider on the tower but it's only down to 800 HP. Still a solid spot for Vitor. With only 20 seconds left, Lucas calls a good game. He realizes that he's not gonna be able to take this right-hand side tower in time. He's gonna go for a desperation push on this left side, but Mega Knight's gonna drop down and clean it up. And I think that is going to be a good game. Wow, five seconds left. Mini Peck on top of the Mother Witch. It's not gonna matter. Vitor taking game number three. And this man just heats up every single World Finals. It looks like he gets better and better as we go on. Fascinating stuff. Vitor going to secure that win. Lucas just not able to make the right plays happen. Or maybe, once again, it was another situation where the starting hands are just putting these players in a really tough spot. That's right. I can't wait to hear more. Andrew, what do you got for us? I am so impressed by you, Vitor. You're having to play in back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back elimination sets. How are you keeping your calm right now? Uh, it's pretty hard, to be honest. Uh, the last game I had to choose, uh, it was a difficult choice, uh, but I think I made the right one, and I made a counter snipe, and 
everything went perfect. In that last game, you had an early, immediate recognition of the matchup, and you did a full sellout. Talk me through that process just a little bit. Uh, I knew since the beginning, since when he played the Mother Witch and the Iwis, that he was playing the MK Mighty Minor deck, so he had no, ch no response to MK Bats and Mini Pekka. Then I punished him, and I won the game right there. Last question, is there anyone special in the audience that you'd like to shout out? Yeah, of course, uh, my girlfriend uh, Katie, my my friend Surgical Galvin, and of course my coach Jeeva's win win all them. All right, you got more work to do. I'm going to let you go. Back to you guys on the desk. What a phenomenal set from Vitor right there. Always so happy for the guy. I mean, the recognition of the deck is something that I can do when I see two or three cards, but he just recognized the matchup, and that MK at the start of the game was just brilliant. Yeah, the other thing is he recognized that his opponent did not have the Electro Wizard or the Mother Witch in Cycle. So the Mega Knight Bats combo just absolutely shredding everything. Side into this deck breakdown, what do you think about deck one? Deck one, Vitor was able to, he did win game number one, correct? Okay, yes. there we go. He did win game number one. We have the Goblin Barrel, the Mighty Miner, and the Bomb Tower. Really, it came down to just early damage. He was able to recognize that Lucas was kind of in that flow, and so he started changing up his defenses. And at the end of the game, the Goblin Barrel finally got the damage it needed, plus the Rocket. Deck two. RG versus Giant Skelly. Vitor, obviously just that one mistake pushing that roll giant away from his cannon. That's right, and then game number three, it comes down to that one mistake. The Mega Knight plus the Bats plus the Mini P.E.K.K.A. Lucas did not have the correct answer for it. And I mean, just brilliant recognition early on. I think we are going to be hopping into the replay now, a bit of telestration from our friend Rich. What do you have for us? Guys, I mean, you've, you've made the point already, and <laughs> it was a, a tough spot that Lucas found himself caught. And let's jump right into the action here. And you guys said it right out the gate, right? <laughs> the big issue right here is the lack of those two cards, the Ewiz and the Mother Witch already used. So as we continue here, we'll take that one off the board. You see the Mega Knight getting ready, and the Mother Witch is going to get absolutely obliterated here with the jump and get ready for the one, two, three. Oh, baby. That right there, that's already a problem. Now with yeah. no E-Wiz, no Mother Witch, those bats behind the MK, absolute pr problem there. And then here comes the Mini P.E.K.K.A. And we'll do this one more time. This is what I call a 4K nightmare. A Mini <laughs> P.E.K.K.A. and a Mega Knight both coming down that right-hand lane. And plenty of Elixir here for Lucas to use. That's the interesting part here. He's at eight, you can see that up high. The fireball comes out though. This is a cycle problem. He does not have the right cards in cycle to reply and then Boom, boom. At this point, it's already game over. You're up against Drill, you're up against Mini Pekka, you're up against MK. There's absolutely no way he's gonna fight back the opposite direction. GG well played, and that is just a quick end to Lucas's journey. Yeah, I, it, it really is unfortunate that that's the way it goes. Really, we wanted to see a brilliant game number three, but I mean, it was brilliance on one end, and uh, you know, just his, his best attempt, that's all we can hope for. Just unfortunates on the other side, really. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that's the end of this game. Luckily, we have another one after this. Andrew, what do you got for us? Well, both these competitors have had their ups and downs so far in the competition, but now it all comes down to the line. One celebrating his birthday, the other's the Prince of Egypt. Sweep and Mohammed Light! So we do have Mo and Sweep going against each other. We have the crowd in the background. I uh, heard a lot of cheers for Mo, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give another special cheer for Sweep. Happy birthday, Me too. Sweep. Happy yeah, birthday. Yeah, there you go, you, you get to do it. <laughs> so in this situation, Sweep is in a spot where, you know, he's going against, quote unquote, an almost undisputed best player in the world. It is his birthday. Maybe he can make some crazy deck picks and make something happen. So, with that original opener, uh, what I, uh, overlay, whatever it is, uh, Mo had a 75% win rate against 
sweeps 81. Earlier on, I was talking about Lucas's 55% win rate, and it's, oh, you know, it's not going through the stages, it's going against these top, top competitors. Mo had a 75% win rate against the best players in the world. Nobody else is able to accomplish that, and we saw in his second set, he was able to, I want to see what he used, minor rocket delivery, and then RG Giant Skeleton Lightning. I talked to him yesterday about that game. I was gushing over just how brilliantly he played, and I mean, Mo showed the potential that we all knew he could do in that second set. Absolutely. I talked to a bit with Mo's analyst this morning, and he was talking about no matter what it would be, sweep or same box today, we are going against sweep here. He's going to have a hard time picking his decks. On the other hand, sweep, he does his own analytical work. I'm sure he has a lot of stuff ready for this game on. Speaking of game win, let's hop straight into it, and we'll see who wins. So in Sweep's earlier set today, game number one, he did use the Lumberloon Royal Recruits. Game number two, he did come out with Giant Sparky Graveyard. The game number two, it, it was argued that he got a little bit too aggressive. I think game number one, he played perfectly. Right here, he's gonna need to play everything perfectly. And he's probably also going to have to get great matchups when Mo, I mean, you, you see his smile right here. It looks like he's in the zone already. Yeah, Mo's just not one of those people that you're really able to outplay. Sweep's definitely going to need a nice matchup. Speaking of the matchup here, I would not be surprised if seeing a Royal Giant near matchup. It's really going to depend on Sweep's spell in this situation. We've seen this near matchup quite a bit, and it really matters if Sweep has the fireball for the Zapper. Fisherman will be able to yank the giant skeleton off to the side. Bomb will come down on top of the fisherman. Not going to be able to yank. You're not going to be able to matter. That is a great defense for Muhammad early on. And only five elixir. Skeleton King is going to come down. Hunter not going to do enough. But with the activation of the ability, this could get scary for Sweep. Sweep uses his own ability as well to try to mitigate, but he's forced to get a Fisherman down. Hunter's still getting some nice shots, and Fisherman's gonna be gone as well. Now Mo's up three, four Elixir. Sweep realizes his opponent plays well. He sends the well play, but Mo realizes his opponent's Elixir deficit and goes immediately for that RG at the bridge. RG will be able to get two shots, not gonna be able to get the third. Hunter doing a brilliant job. That could have been a lot worse. It, it, it was six to three, I believe, and an RG just on the board, but the Hunter, quick response, and uh, right there, another great interaction from Muhammad. No shots from the Hunter because of that E-Spirit placement. Now the Elixir is fairly even, almost completely even, but Mo's up over a 1,000 damage lead. Giant still in the back from Sweep. Once again, I'm very interested to see Sweep's last card. If it is a fireball, I think he can have a nice chance to try and come back, especially when you have this double Big Hoss, double Giant Skelly, Skelly King, uh, Roll Giant deck. Wow, and so look at the way he, he utilizes his tombstone. A lot of players don't play it that way. They use the tombstone just kind of to stack skeletons. We're seeing a lot of value from the tombstones just because he's trying to force the giant skeleton to go to those troops instead of the fishermen, the hunters, and the skeleton kings. Really nice point there. Giant Skelly in the back from Sweep. Really nice fireball from Sweep as well. Fireball log. It seems like... Sweep's game plan right now is to just stack Giant Skellies in his right-hand lane, but Moe's completely fine with that game plan. He's just sitting back, defending as best as he can as well, and Sweep is going to have a very difficult time breaking through if he continues to play like this. This is a very fun matchup to watch because you get to see the difference when one player has the Giant Skeleton plus the Skeleton King going against the player who, uh, you know, it, it kind of feels like it's naked without the Giant Skeleton to place in front of the RG. That's why we saw the early Giant Skeleton at the bridge by itself because you aren't building those those strong, strong pushes the same way. That's why it's really cool to see how he's using the Tombstone, just because he has to play the game a lot differently than the normal way that Sweep gets to play. Absolutely. Sweep is starting to chip away a bit with some fireballs now, but once again, Moe's just focusing on very, very solid defense. Really nice Tombstone as well for Moe here, winning this Fisherman battle at the bridge. And they're just jostling. They're jostling, but Sweep needs a way to break through, and Moe's not giving him that opportunity. 
Right there, great Fisherman Yank. That wow. is going to take out the Skeleton King. Skeleton King getting no value whatsoever. Six Elixir for Muhammad Light. Does he want to go in? Eight Elixir in response from Sweep. Will he be able to pull the RG? Is it going to matter? Prelog not going to be able to hit anything, and that's okay. Eastbury taking out the bats. Bats are gone off the board, but the RG is not. Lightning comes down, oh. and the RG takes it. Beautiful, almost perfect game for Mo there. Sweep sends the well played. He knows it as well. Yeah, Sweep only was able to get 300 HP throughout that matchup. I mean, that was just dominance throughout the game. And just, I it, it was so fun to watch a game without Giant Skeleton really just the the domination of the skeleton king and the domination of the tombstone i don't think i've ever witnessed that in an rg matchup absolutely the tombstone is absolutely huge there he did a great job of cycling multiple of them even pulling in the fishermen's stacking skeletons in that lane and so he just doesn't have any sort of mother witch or some sort of splash unit to deal with all that swarm yeah, we see the average cost. Muhammad Light was able to cycle just a little bit quicker. That's the reason why he was able to use the Skeleton King, use the Tombstone the way he did. I want to take a look at the community predictions. I want to see, oh wow. my goodness, 86 to 14%. Uh, I mean, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense. I, I would say Sweep easily has a 25% chance of winning. 86 to 14, I don't think I've ever seen that before. That's got to be the largest disparity in a prediction that we've seen so far. Molite is one of the best players, if not the best player in the game. Sweep really needs to be thinking about his deck picks in the remainder of this matchup because if you are going to be the best player, you're going to need a lot of stuff on your side when it comes to actual cards in the matchup. So right there, game number one, Sweep did come out with more meta, and that's something that we talked about in day number one, where he started out with meta, and then he was willing to go the E-Giant at the bridge, plus the Mini Pekka, plus the Inferno Giant was able to take out that early tower. So I like that he went with the meta game number one. Obviously, it doesn't work out, but I think he has adjusted from his earlier set, and I think that is the way to go. Absolutely, I think you gotta get pretty crazy with it. I would love to see something like a Sparky, a clone, maybe even a crazy E-Giant yeah. graveyard deck or yeah. anything really. <laughs> yeah, I mean, now that we have used the meta, now this is when he gets to, uh, to whip out whatever he wants. And uh, I really wouldn't mind seeing Electro Giant game number two. It, he played the matchup perfectly. I mean, he just knew what he was supposed to do. The Mini Pekka at the bridge, plus the Inferno Dragon. I, I thought the push was kind of dead, but I talked to him after, and he was, he was, he was certain that it was the right play. And uh, when he took a tower that early on, it kind of makes sense that he was certain. But uh, we are ready for it. Game number two on its way. Good luck from both players. A little emote from Sweep. He's feeling pretty comfortable. Mo is too. Miner from Sweep here. And my Miner's gonna pick that up quite nicely. So, so far throughout the day, the player that lost earlier in the day is currently one and two. Let's see if Mo will, uh, will make it one and three. That's right. It'll be three players that lost in day one will have the advantage in uh, day number two just because they didn't have to play. They didn't have to use those decks earlier on in the day. Uh, good point there. Looks like we're seeing a bit of a mirror matchup sweep going to a more meta situation once again. And honestly, if you are sweep in a situation like this, you're realizing you're going up against basically a mirror matchup against one of the best players in the world. Uh, this is just not a situation I'd like to put myself in. Yeah, that is a very intimidating uh, uh, thing to see. We do see the Ice Spirit cycled over the middle. Will he be able to get out anything in time? Mighty Miner at the bridge. And... Uh, you know, I don't, I don't really understand that. He, he, he wants to protect the mortar. It, it's one of those things where I know it's Mo, so I know it's correct, but I don't understand, and that's okay. I, I don't always need to know. I think the biggest thing here is that he just realized he's up Elixir. He's forcing Sweep to continually defend, but it ends up working out. He does force out Sweep's win condition, the Miner, as well as he gets a very nice mortar shot. Now. We're in a situation where Mo's still up some elixir. He's going to reset with some guards in the back. We'll see if Sweep can try and turn the tides here to make something happen. See, when I watch Muhammad Light's gameplay, it's really cool because, you know, I, I, I write notes throughout the day so that way I can have questions, all that kind of stuff. But Mo is the player where I'm writing questions throughout the day just to ask him later on, why, why do you make that play? And 
I, I, I feel like I feel like I might be able to become that kind of player if I just if I ask enough questions. Yeah, Mo is definitely the right person to ask questions. I would love some free coaching from him. Yeah. But no kidding. <laughs> But uh, back to the gameplay here. Mortar is connecting for sweep on this right inside. Miner's going to come down. Mighty Mort Miner is able to take out most of the Mortar. Mortar plus Poison will be able to take it out. Musketeer forced out in response. And we're seeing some brilliant split lane pressure from Muhammad Light. The, the two towers that are damaged are fairly even. Actually, everything is fairly even. Muhammad Light just has that advantage overall. Almost a perfect mirror match here. Only difference is Sweep is running the arrows. I think the arrows are going to be helping out just a bit because you can go for those pre-arrows along with your miner to try and catch some of those guards. And that's definitely something he's going to need to do if he wants to get the damage lead back in this match. 1758 to 2023. We do see the Ice Spirit placed perfectly. Not going to come out with the delivery in time, but with the help of the mortar, it is going to be cleaned up nicely. 20 HP separating the two players, and Sweep has to feel phenomenal about that. He's played this matchup very, very well. One of the main differences, arrows and delivery. He can use those arrows on offense. He can defend the guards every single time they get played, and Muhammad Light doesn't have that same opportunity. Absolutely, I like the mind games from Mo Light there. Sweep going for that pre-arrows every single time, but Mo is realizing that the pre-arrows will come down. And look how aggressive on the left-hand side he is. Very close match, but Mo's just barely... In. Oh wait, Mighty Miner! Ice oh. Spirit able to protect the tower just in time, 1128 to 1386. Oh. But that's okay for Muhammad, able to get the chip shot and well played coming out from Sweep. I mean, Sweep, I, I, I don't know if he has the matchup just because he can't cycle as quick as Mo. And I mean, knowing Mo, he's just so smart with every single situation. He just makes the right play time and time again. 638 to 1395, Muhammad Light is putting on a clinic. He does catch the miner with his own miner, but that's not how you want to be playing this game. You need to get your own miners on the tower. We're heading straight into Triple Elixir right now. Mighty miners are on the board. We have multiple mortars ever, but this poison is getting a lot of value on the defense. Ice Spirit not going to be able to matter. I think the guards are going to be in play. This is a weird situation. Okay, there you go. I was very scared that the guards were placed oh. a little bit too high. Musketeer coming out from sweep. He has to use the Musketeer, oh. and the Ice Spirit gets the jump. Minor poison on the right hand side. At this point, Mo just needs one little bit of extra damage. Musketeer does get picked up, but the miner's gonna connect, and that is going to be game. Muhammad Light going to take game two, knocking out Sweep out of the bracket. What do you think about that? Yeah, just a brilliant set overall for Muhammad Light. He has really shown that he was able to recover from his earlier set in day number one. I think he's 4-0 since then. In every single match, he has played a, a, a perfect 10 out of 10. I've been, I've been given ratings, you know, behind the scenes to each and every player. Sandbox has done well. Air Server has done well, a lot of those players. But since that opening set, Muhammad Light has a 39 out of 40 for me. I, I think I saw one mistake. I feel like I might be wrong, though. Maybe he didn't make any mistakes. I feel like he's actually playing better and better as the yes. more games he plays. I think the biggest thing in that match was the fact that he was always preventing the prediction errors from getting value. He was always waiting to play the guards or using the role of delivery on defense. Let's go ahead and hop over to the stage to see how Muhammad Light is feeling. Momo, congratulations. Last night we were talking in the hotel lobby. You were telling me that first set, you felt the lights just a little bit. You felt the crowd just a little bit. You seem dialed in now. How's your confidence at the moment? Well, my confidence is over the moon at the moment. I'm, like, uh, I'm used to playing at the loser's bracket a lot. Like Most of my competitions that I had won were from the loser's bracket. Rarely had them from the winners. So I think uh, I'll just continue with the flow, really. Flow, really. Yeah, one of the few people that's ever been able to work through that loser's bracket and win a grand championship. You had near mirror matchups in both games. Was that a plan with you and Jebez? Was that an accident? I can't imagine it was. Well, it was an accident, but like uh, he had arrows, so I don't think it was a, a bit, like a near mirror matchup because it, the, the matchup is much different now. The arrows of the delivery, but yeah, like uh, I'm just playing comfort really, and it worked out. Uh, sometimes you need to play comfort on a stage like this, really. <laughs> That's right, comfortability indeed. Congratulations, Mo. I know you got a little bit more to do today. We'll see you in a little bit. Thanks a lot, Andrew. I guess a, a sigh of relief maybe in the arena in some ways, having avoided losing two of our top players in Mo and, of course, in Mugi early on, but also some sadness as one of the most stylish players in all of Clash Royale takes an exit at this stage. 
Yeah, I think he really impressed a lot of different players. It doesn't mean, you know, he didn't need those off meta decks. He was able to perform, and I think he played really well throughout this tournament. Yes, but then of course you get the master class from Muhammad Light. Let's take a look at the decks from this matchup, and in round number one, game number one, it was the RG versus the RG, but the big difference is here, the spells, and of course the giant skeleton. Yeah, the spells provided a lot of value. The lightning was able to take out the hunters, the fishermen, and just, I mean, I, it, it's weird. It's so cool. I, I get to say it time and time again. The use of the tombstone was so great for Muhammad Light. And on to our second deck here. And this, again, a near mirror match. And you look at those slight differences and the arrows versus the delivery. Talk to me a bit about what you saw from Muhammad Light here. Yeah, I mean, it just comes down to playing the game perfectly. The arrows should provide the advantage because you get to use the arrows on top of the guards, uh, you know, when they're placed offensively, defensively, you get value on top of musketeers, but it didn't matter. Muhammad Light spread out his troops. He didn't play the guards in positions where Sweep could predict. And I mean, it was just phenomenal mortar gameplay. It, it, it couldn't have been better. And even the use of the abilities of the Mighty Miner was perfect as well. I think we say this about so many players of this generation, but Muhammad Light started out as a mortar miner player. And of course you see yes. him in the big moments, uh, you know, mortar miner for Mo. Lapakati, Igor, Benzeradel, like yes. so many players who started out like that. Let's take a look at the replay from this action here. Josh, talk me through it. And there we go, 38 seconds left. We see the Ice Spirit able to get the jump. And I mean, really, he's trying to pressure, trying to pressure. Poison plus minor, good game coming out. With the arrows, he had no elixir whatsoever. Guards come out on the Musketeer. Well, who's gonna stop the minor? Good game coming out from Sweep. We see the smile, we see the laughs. I think he's very content with how he played. Obviously, he would have loved to go to the next round, but I think he can feel proud about it. And of course, some applause there from Mama Light. <laughs> Happy to see her son continue to move on. And the smiles from Sweep. Right? We've seen so many people be kind of emotional about it, whereas Sweep is just happy yes. and ready to go. Well, speaking of ready to go, we have our next elimination match ready right now. Juicy J, take us away. In our next elimination match, we have our lower bracket destroyer, Humble Keef, versus the defending world champion, Moogie. And this will be a fascinating one so far. Keefe has been able to withstand the rule of the fates, take matches that he's not supposed to on paper win, and go ahead instead and take control. But now he has his hardest test yet. Can he beat a man who's been in perfect form, really, except for a tough matchup against one of the other all-time greats? Can he get past Moogie here? That's the really big question to answer. Of course, he has a lot of ground to cover. Moody with the exceptionally deep deck pool. The deck picking today has been phenomenal, but Keefe has been doing the same thing as well, playing his best Clash Royale and coming in with the best selection we've seen from him throughout his Clash Royale career. I really couldn't agree with you more, Rich, when you talk about both these guys playing at the highest level of their game. I think the biggest part about that is as of right now, Moogie's highest level is just a little bit higher than Keefe's. And if they both are playing at their absolute best in this situation, it will come down to matchups. And we've seen Moogie have great matchups. We've seen him play through some difficult ones, but this is really it. A lot of people had, there was rumblings out there on Twitter. There was rumblings here we got in Helsinki about Moogie not being able to pick his own decks. Well, I think he shut those people up pretty quickly. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we've also seen, you know, a lot of talk about coaches not being on stage and who can pick their own decks. We've seen the coaches do a lot of adaptation. I was talking with Jebba's last night. He was up till five in the morning picking decks for his players, preparing their sheets for them. So you have to imagine that Tight's doing the same thing here with Moogie, making sure that they have a lot of progressions ready, and then really talking about, okay, what type of changes might we make in game two and game three? Yeah, and that's exactly why they have that support staff, and that's why the best analysts and the best coaches are in the highest demand. But now it's about putting all of that practice into play. Game one, elimination time. Will it be Keith? Will it be Moogie? Let's find out. Keith made his big splash on the scene last year in the ESL Mobile Open for the EU and MENA Spring Ladder, taking first place on that competition. And since then, it's been a nice run of performance for him. He, of course, wants to continue that run here with a win over Moogie. 
but that might be the most significant win of his career. Well, you watch that back and forth set between Moogie and Morton, and it was anyone's game, but then you went to Moogie versus Doom, and it was just absolute domination, and now an early golem comes down, and this actually goes back to a conversation we had with Morton a long time ago. I think you were the one that brought up the question, Morton, why would you play golem? And I think it was against Mohammed Light, and his answer was, when you can't figure out a way to beat him, you gotta try anything. So maybe Keep is trying a little bit of that and also trying to keep his opponent guessing. Yeah, maybe trying to figure out that matchup advantage, right? Golem's a very polarizing card. Either you're in a lot of trouble or you're in great position. So far, it looks like the former of those two as the Hunter Giant Skeleton and Fisherman able to handle that Lava Push. Yeah, I mean, he's got a great amount of DPS. He's got control there with the Fisherman. He's got a great way to create opposite lane pressure with that Royal Giant when he gets into double and triple. He doesn't have to focus in just one lane. This is gonna be a tough one because there's always more outplay ability with this RG deck than there is with that Golem deck. Mookie should be able to handle this push fairly simply. Barb Barrel may be a half step early, but the e is behind does clean up the majority of those skeletons, but the Archer Queen has to come out, and that's a nice early blow here, plus the AQ off the board, and Keef, with just about two minutes played, takes a nice lead. Yeah, and that is a very good spot to be in. It is only 500 HP, but as we get into double here, Keef will be able to turn up the heat just a little bit more. You can see how heavy his deck is. Yes, Moogie's is heavy as well. We'll see what that means in terms of Royal Giant maybe in the opposite lane, and then continuing to cycle these giant skeletons and hunters down the right side. 16.54 to 21.31 as Keef sets up his Night Witch in the back, and there you go, you called that, Andrew. The opposite lane pressure cheat Keith trying to respond here with the Tombstone plus Skelly King combination. And Hunter putting in work on this Golem. AQ behind to protect it. That is a brilliant, uh, well, I was going to say, the E-Spirit almost cleaned up all the bats, but still protected the Hunter. But Moogie is definitely still getting overwhelmed here. Barbell goes out on the right-hand side. He doesn't have E-Spirit. He doesn't have a lot to deal with the Skeleton King. But luckily, the Skelly King was getting tanked for by the Skellies as opposed to the other situation, which could have been horrifying for Moogie. Yeah, the opposite way around would have been an absolute disaster. Disaster. So at the moment, Mookie able to survive, but playing in kind of an uncomfortable position here. Maybe it was a little bit of the cycle being not exactly what he wanted. Now Fisherman going to do its job to pull that golem away, and that's perfect timing there, keeping the golem from exploding on the tower, instead in a safe spot in the middle. And now Mookie has a decent counter push in both lanes. Giant Skeletons bout out in both directions. And we'll see how he wants to deal with this now that the Tombstone is off the board. A Night Witch has to come down to defend this Royal Giant, but the Giant Skeleton's still tanking. And the Royal Giant does get pulled back by the NATO. Can Moogie get on that? Must the Skeleton that King! No, the, the Skeleton, skeleton King! Oh, the tower. My oh my word! Moogie gets caught looking! And he cannot believe it. Keith taking game number one in fairly decisive fashion there. And Moogie just felt like he was, and it looked like he was always stretched very thin. 100%, you know, and looking at those defenses, they were just a little bit less effective than I think Moogie would have liked. Obviously, always trying to protect that hunter, needing to get a little bit more value out of that E-Spirit. But it's so difficult once you already have that deficit in damage. And you can see, Keith can just set up a golem in the back, yep. decide to either support or decide to over, over defend. And in this case, the NATO being a key factor there to pull things together, pull things back as well. So Keith with a big number one game, and now he's one win away from sending the former world champion packing. That is insane. What an accomplishment. Let's take a look here at the replay from that last game. Hey, Chief Keith on top. There. And this was so fascinating because it did feel like for a little while Moogie was in a good spot. You see the dual lane pressure, but the damage already in on that bottom right hand side. Yeah. And you see the pressure start to come in on the left hand lane. And this bar barrel, the Night Witch is a little bit long there, and the E Wiz doesn't take care of business. And at that point, the opposite lane pressure comes in from the Skelly King. Look at that. You have Moogie down to almost no elixir. At that point, he knows it's over and he's trying to plan for game number two. Well, the fish boy did him dirty. What happens? It pulled the giant 
Giants, or excuse me, the Skeleton King in. It gets it away from the Giant Skeleton Bomb, and then it's popping the ability right at that moment. So not only does it bring the threat closer, but it gets it away from your biggest defensive force in that bomb going off. Had that bomb went off, there could have been a bar barrel maybe to go on top of it. But at that point, it's too late, it's too much, and we've seen this many times in our career together. Fishermen can do you right, or they can do you so, so dirty. The Brutus of Clash Royale, just <laughs> yes. always stabbing you right in the back with a slimy fish. Let's take a look at how you guys saw this matchup, and 87% wow. for Moogie, 13% for Keith. Well, as we've said before, we'll see if that 13% proves to be the winners in this one, as we are getting very close to game number two, and Moogie having a fight from behind. Keith just gaining power from these deficits in our voting. He goes, fine, keep voting against me. I got nothing to lose. I've gone farther than a lot of you guys ever thought I would. I've gone farther than a lot of you people have thought I ever deserved. But he has shown he's got it. He deserves to be here. And he has now taken one game off of our defending world champion. It's time, Rich. Let's go. Game number two right now. NATO out for Keefe. We'll see if that means Moogie goes with something that would be good against NATO. And there you go, minor first play. And you know what? I'm a bit surprised Moogie didn't go minor first play to the inside corner instead, knowing that NATO's out. Yeah, I mean, anywhere other than the safe spot, other than, and also you never want to put yourself in range of that snowball. A nice log comes down, actually gets on top of those guards. So that means this Royal Ghost ended up getting a decent amount of elixir, but we're still even. And yeah, it's one of those things, recognition. I don't know if that means maybe he's already a bit nervous. Possibly, and here you go. Keep looking like Royal Giant so far. We'll see if that's what he is playing, in fact. Keith with a 43% win rate with Royal Giant. If that is the case, he's only ran it 14 times this season. And a great call here also from Keith to go with Archer Queen knowing Lightning's out. So you see a lot of troops here susceptible to Lightning in the deck of Keith. Smart dexmanship. I'll use it again yeah, for you. Yeah, there it is. Just do it every time I'm up here. It makes me happy. And immediately a Royal Giant at the bridge to tank for this Royal Ghost. And it is Mortar for Moogie. And interesting, we, we have not seen Tite let, Mor let Moogie play Mortar Minor very often, but now in a tough spot, a deck he's great with. We'll see if he can carry the day. One of those things, your life is on the line. You know, everyone knows how good you are with many decks out there. You're Moogie, go with your comfort, try to extend this to game number three. Well, he has the Mortar, he has the Mighty Miner, has the Log, the Musky for DPS, the Guards for DPS. The Ice Spirit to reset and mm -hmm. get another Mortar down. There's so many great options. That's a really great point, Rich. A lot of ways to control that Royal Giant and with the Miner to kind of snipe stuff across the bridge. The Guards and the Miner, we'll see what kind of factor that becomes when, it, when we're talking about the guards for the fisherman and the miner for either the fisherman or that mother witch. We've seen a good amount of double miner today. I think maybe in almost five or six games have we seen double miner just today. And now we see keep going back in with the royal giant to get on top of that mortar. Musketeer to respond. I've always wondered, is the mighty miner the miner's dad with the mustache? Or is it the other way around? Are they related at all? We got to talk friends? to Rick and Max about that. We need to know the lore, guys. We need to know the lore. And a perfectly timed Ice Spirit there by Mookie to stop that Archer Queen. And then Keith right back on the offensive. He's been really, really aggressive all game, Rich. Well, I mean, look, he, he's on a clearly feeling comfortable yeah. and has recognized discomfort in his opponents. So what capitalized on discomfort? Pressure. And the pig starts taking for the Royal Ghost. Not a lot came out of it there for Moogie, luckily. And here we go, entering into sudden death overtime as Moogie sets up that defensive mortar. It is a slight lead for the defending world champion, 26-46 to 28-83. Surround there with the guards and now a Mother Witch comes down to get some more pigs on the board to try to distract that Mighty Miner, and then it will get pulled away. So this gets a little dangerous for Moogie, but still good damage already in on that Royal Giant. Yeah, damage in early, and then of course able to DPS down the rest. He should be back to a, another Mortar here fairly easily. There you go. 
the Archer Queen might be the X Factor yeah. here as the Fireball comes in. Mighty Miner comes down. Archer Queen in the ability, Archie on tower, and now we have the first significant offense out of Keith. Yeah, and you saw on the other side of it, while that bout was going on, Musketeer for Moogie connecting in the right-hand lane, getting a few shots in to give him the lead. 24-38 now to below 1,800, 1,754, and Moogie strikes right back. And you see Moogie still going to the outside. I'm wondering if he's trying to avoid a King Tower activation courtesy of that Fisherman, so that's also a possibility here. Royal Giant working down the left-hand side for Keith as he's kind of pumped the brakes as we're getting close to Triple Elixir. You know exactly what he's going for. So does Moogie. He's looking for that second Royal Giant to come down. So Moogie's going to be cycling around, getting damage in early on. And that Mortar Shot is actually a big deal on top of that Archer Queen. A very, very nice bit of play there on the left-hand side. AQ off the board. Miners have been so defensive, and that's been kind of the key for Moogie so far. Defensive Miners controlling those Royal Ghosts mostly, and then cycling back around to the offensive side. And that was some nice fireball value there for Keith, getting both the Mortar and the Musketeer. 35 seconds remain. Royal Giants out in both directions. Royal Ghosts in on the right-hand side with the Mother Witch. Fishboy behind the Royal Giant on the left. Mortar does hold, Mighty Miner plus Miner able to take care of the Royal Giant. It does get one shot in on the right-hand side, but 20 seconds left. It looks like, barring a significant mistake, this should be Moogie's game. That Mighty Miner just put in so much work for Moogie this game. He's got it, he can log this back. He doesn't even need to stop with an Ice Spirit. Gets it off the board just in time. Poison on the King, Poison on the Princess. We're going to a best of one to stay alive. Keith against our reigning world champion. That's just what we saw from Mo a moment ago. A master class in Mortar Minor, and I was sitting behind Rick and Max. He mentioned them earlier. We were all just sitting there stunned watching the show that we saw put on by Mo. I'm sure the same jaws are being picked off off the floor after seeing what Moogie just did. Yeah, I had to pick mine up off the floor, run on stage to interview him. I could hardly collect my words because it was beautiful. And Sweet played excellent. He played phenomenal Clash Royale. Mo just mowed. That's it. And then same thing here with Moogie as well. There wasn't a whole lot different that Keith could have done in that situation. Had a couple of moments where maybe, maybe you slide on through if your opponent makes a mistake, but it's Moogie. He's not making a mistake in that situation. Right. And that's what I loved about what Keith did out there. He kept varying up his offense. You saw him go pretty aggressive in single, and he stayed pretty aggressive throughout most of double. And then he kind of slowed down at the end of double and was like, I need to get more RGs on the board, maybe even three possibly. But Moogie just doing an excellent job recognizing I've got the good damage lead. I've got great ways to respond and defend. I do not need to overextend myself. And so when it comes down to things like the miner maybe not going to the safe spot early on, it seems like he found his footing very quickly in that game. Interesting thing here, note that both these cards have the same four card cycle, meaning the lowest elixir you have to spend to get back around to a certain card. But it's that average cost difference yeah. where Keith just took a little bit longer to do that cycle, whereas Moogie was always able to get that mortar back in the mix. And we never saw him in a situation where the defense he needed wasn't available. And you saw separated by less than, what was it, like 150 something HP in terms of tower damage there. So Keith was doing everything he could, but the thing was his damage was a little bit more split where Moe's was all in on one. One, or excuse me, Moogie's was all in on one side. And this has just been a wonderful showing between two of the best players in the world in back-to-back -back sets, trying to stay alive. And like I said just a moment ago, now we are in a best of one. But if you look at Keith, even though he's more of the sophomore rookie, whatever you want to call him, he still looks dialed in. He looks super calm, and right now he just needs to make a great decision. We played Golem in game number one, played RG in game number two. He's clearly looked at this and go, hey, I'm not going to win a, a cycle matchup here. Very curious about this game three choice. No more waiting, though. Let's jump right in to our third and final. And some good lucks out on one side, same from the other, and split wall breakers at the bridge for Moogie. So Moogie clearly going fast cycle, and Keith may be doing the same thing here. Moogie going for the King Tower activation, and he gets oh. it on the live stage. Wow. You love to see it. 
That is a beautiful technique for those of you at home. If you play those skeletons in line with the mortar when it's played in the middle, and you release right when that clock hits three quarters of the way on the mortar, that's how you pull off that move. Very, very difficult, but a clean King Tower activation there for Moogie. Oh, what are you talking about? I can do that in World Finals with my life on the line, no problem. Yeah, totally, I'm sure you could. <laughs> Bandit on top of this Valkyrie to respawn. 3027 is the only damage done, but that King Tower being activated. Oh, boy. And the pre snowball. Now the mortar comes down, and now Moogie is going to look to punish. Yeah, mortar now out of cycle. Let's see what Moogie does with that moment. Ghost in the back. Musketeer not going to do much here. I love the idea. Moogie starts to build the push from the back. Another set of wall breakers comes down. Nice use of the delivery there. And just like that, what looked like spelling complete danger for Keith, he sews it all up with a beautiful delivery. He's got a nice situation here, right? He has the mortar or the delivery or the Valk, yeah. right? And particularly the mortar and delivery to be used primarily for those wall breakers. And then want to keep that Valk there for the goblin drill. Those are all pretty nice situations for him if he can maintain that cycle. Ghost a little high there, so the cannon cart's not in range of the Princess Tower. The worst things can happen. Moogie up by about a half an elixir right now, maybe three quarters, as we are 15 seconds away from double. Wall breaker split. Something's gonna need to distract. There we go. Cannon comes in to play some defense and keep that mortar off those goblins. And that's the hard part about that high mortar, right? Is you play that mortar in the middle to pull those wall breakers, hoping for some action the opposite direction. But this deck gets around so fast that cannon should be there regularly. Keith did win his original 20 win challenge with a mortar deck. Not exactly this one here, but clearly a deck that he does love. He's ran it 35 times in the competitive scene with still a 60% win rate. And that's kind of the golden wow. number. Another predictive snowball. You love to see it from Moogie. And he's just cracking this game wide open. Cannon Cart with the EQ on the right hand side. Very, very interesting here. You know, we have not seen a secondary win condition so far. This has just been Cannon Cart Mortar EQ. Yeah, we'll see. It's good with GY. Not impossible. Hog. We'll find out. Valk to protect the mortar, but the mortar shoots at a tile, I guess it didn't like very much. <laughs> and there we go. That's a big connection There's here hogs. from the Hawks. I was close. And drill in on that left hand side. Mortar to distract the Royal Ghost and the Wall Breakers, but wow. nothing is there for the drill. And that is a huge mistake by Keith. I mean, he had less elixir than anyone has ever had. I think he might have had negative elixir at that point and we're just waiting for some of it to come back. And it's clear the pressure has started to truly mount for our friend from Italy. Bandit plus wall breakers to the right. Snowball in again. That left hand tower in a whole lot of trouble. And the bandits on the tower. It's one of those things where I think Keith thinks that Moogie won't keep pre snowballing because he thinks that he thinks he won't keep playing the spears. But he keeps doing it and he keeps getting so much value. He's having to Valk to control the middle. It's just not working for him. Here we go. Cannon card to the left hand side. Has to Valk onto this specific drill. There's no way not to. Speed That's to the it. Left. That's, That's the, the game. GG. That's a well played. And Moogie stays alive at our World Finals. Stays alive and puts on a clinic yes, in absolutely. games two and in games three. Keith did a great job, and you know what? Maybe Morton was right. Maybe if you don't know how to beat him, you just slap that big bag of rocks down and pray for the best. But when it came down to games two and games three, Moogie just absolute dominant fashion. And we saw a little bit of the Japanese fans there cheering along. Let's go head down with Joshua AC sharing as he's standing by with Moogie. Skeletons to activate the King Tower on the mortar. Prediction snowball after prediction snowball. $50,000 guaranteed. How do you feel? I'm a skeleton. I'm a king tower. I'm a activator. I'm a king tower. 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 まあ、読みはやっぱすべてうまくいきました。で、賞金はまあ必要なんですけど、まあ、それよりも2連覇という名誉を目指して頑張りたいと思います。So yeah, my predictions were on point. I have to admit that um, the money, obviously, I do need it, but that's not important. To be two times in a row the world champion, that's what's important here. 
It was so fun backstage. I kept writing one prediction, two okay. prediction, three prediction, four prediction. It was phenomenal to see back to the casters. Thanks a lot, Josh. Phenomenal it was. Of course, what do you want to see other than the best players in the world playing their best Clash Royale? That's why you fly to Finland. Yeah, and you know, you hear Mohamed Light go, I'm a person that's worked through the bottom bracket over and over again. He's not too worried about it. Well, he's got a little competition now because Mohamed Light and Mugi continue to work their way through. And again, with Mugi, just beautiful gameplay. He never blinked once with those snowballs just all over it. Let's take a look at the decks from this this matchup, game number one, we've talked about it. Sometimes you go for Golem to get that big matchup and Keith able to do it here. Yeah, it's just one of those things you hate to see it in terms of I don't like Golem, but I do love that Keith was able to take that game. Go on to game number two. Moogie needed to calm himself down, I believe. So he goes back to comfort. He actually gets a great draw here. You get good value with that poison log all over the place. And of course, the Mighty Miner putting in work on that Royal Giant. And we've seen the log combined with the Ice Spirit over and over again to deal with and reset if necessary. Game three, Rich, thoughts? Oh my word. This was like trying to get through a maze, but there's no action actual doors. Every time that Keith went some different direction, tried something new, he was stymied. The big thing here was that he kept on not having the Valk when he wanted it, and he's playing the Spear Goblin to defend against those drills, and Moogie's just like, yeah, here comes the Snowball. GG, well played. The drill damage here was absolutely insane. It in this match. really was. The Goblins just kept stacking up over and over and over again. We're going to check the bracket in just one moment, but Juicy, any thoughts on that matchup that we just saw? That was a fantastic gameplay from Mugi, I think the biggest thing there that Keith was just not able to get a very nice Roll Hogs plus pre earthquake on that cannon, but that was just because Mugi was playing so well, always applying pressure on both lanes like he, we see that he likes to do, going for the prediction snowballs at the right moment, and also a bit of a late roll, roll deliveries from Keith, I feel like. Yeah, maybe yeah. a half step behind, and part of that, you talk about the, the hog EQ push. That's an expensive push to do and against a cycle player like that, so ended up with Mugi getting the big dub. Let's go ahead and take a look, though, at the bracket as we stand with one more match left on the day. And, Andrew, this upper bracket, you talk about those upper semifinals, Sandbox and Samuel, last year's number three finisher during the regular season up against one of the greats in the game, and then Morton Air Surfer, two friends going head-to-head -head yes, in that upper bracket. That's really the thing. We saw it earlier today with with Lucas and Vitor, how tough it could be going up against your friend, but when it comes down to it, it's about who comes out on top, and you, that's gonna be an absolute barn burner of an upper bracket. AC is on stage, we'll check in with this bracket at the end of the day, because we all know who's coming up next. Josh, what do we got? We are truly being spoiled right now with this kind of gameplay. Throughout the day, all these matches keep heating up, but specifically, these two players are heating up as well. Vitor and Mohamed Lai. Andrew, this is a fascinating matchup because on paper, Muhammad Light should win this one nine times out of 10, but Vitor has shown today and throughout his career the ability to overcome expectations and perform in those most difficult moments. That is so beautifully put, overcoming expectations. He's been in almost un... It just doesn't make sense why he is such an underdog time and time again, year after year, but he's proven to us here on this stage. And I think the most impressive thing, that's why I wanted to talk to him about it, at that interview is just, man, you are now going back to back to back to back in the lower bracket, but the names just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger. He just went through Lucas, one of his old teammates, one of his good friends, and now he's got the Prince of Egypt, the hardest out probably in the game other than maybe Moogie. And this is, a, I think, a much more difficult matchup because, you know, if you looked at Twitter late, uh, a little bit after the match, Lucas was talking about nerves. Yes. And, he, and that's been a thing he struggled with here and there. I don't think that the Vitor's going to have this same opening against Mohamed Light. No, absolutely not. And also just tipping my hat to Lucas, one of my favorite players in the game, and to look to see how much he grew. And there's Mama Light feeling the heat, feeling the lights, rooting on her son. And, and, and there's numerous parents here in the crowd, and it does warm my heart <laughs> as I get older. I think it's just adorable. We're hopping into game one. Mohamed Light, Vitor. Last match of the day.
finishing my thought earlier about Luke, as I was just saying, it's so good to see how far he came this year after struggling so much in his prior World Finals. His run has come to an end, but obviously nothing to hang his head over. Mo Light bottom, Vitor top. And Mo Light picking up the drill with the giant skeleton, so GS is in both directions. Of course, his will cross the bridge much earlier, so some help from the Princess Tower on the side of Vitor. Giant Skeleton saw virtually zero drop off in our entire World Finals. And I think a lot of people expected Mirror to disappear. And I think they were kind of up in the air about Giant Skeleton. And now we've seen after a couple days of competition, he has not gone anywhere and I'm okay with it. And just not quite able to keep that Magic Archer protected is Vitor. So instead gonna lose a bridge fight. And this is interesting, looking like a Mirror yeah. matchup potential between Vitor and Mo and Royal Ghost and Golden Knight on there. Golden Knight doesn't survive, still had the ability, could have been brutal for Vitor, but very clean defense from the man from Portugal. Four and change on the board for Vitor, three in the hole for Mohamed Light, picks up the E-Wiz with the giant skeleton. And Mo with a bit of a smile on his face there, which is, Honestly, it's kind of the most intimidating smile you'll ever see in Clash Royale. Yeah, that is certainly a concern if you're on the other side of the podium from him. As we pass the midway point of regulation time, 90 seconds gone and very little damage done. Slight lead right now for Mo. And a NATO to pull everything together there. The giant skeleton does need to be responded to. Whoa. The giant skelly bomb is on the tower. Look at Mo's face. He, he knows. Yeah, he cannot believe it. I think that he he thought that it might stop a half step earlier or the ghost might turn and intercept it. Maybe a tile before didn't happen. And now suddenly Muhammad Light in a big hole and what's going to be a very tightly contested mirror match. And Rich, if you saw yesterday when Muhammad Light made mistakes in his set number one, he looked down and out, whereas this this time he was smiling, going, all right, you've got one on me. And again, that is exactly what he needs to do. A chain to get through. Magic Archer goes down. Giant Skeleton in tow. Yeah, it does not quite get all the way through, but at least wins the fight at the bridge. Cannon should help behind this Giant Skeleton to prevent the other one from getting too far down into enemy territory. Drill now for Vitor and picked up by the Ghost, but that might let a Goblin through, and it does. A goblin through indeed, and now behind by 1200 HP, and oh, the Golden wow. Knight doesn't stop it at the bridge. It still connects the tower, and I guarantee you Mo is starting to get a bit frustrated with some of these interactions. Yeah, that was just an aggressive chain all the way through, and so far it's been Vitor taking advantage of sort of the, you might call them the, the minor cheese elements of the deck, right? The Golden Knight, and what and a that's a great NATO from Mo. He has to create space now with only two minutes remaining. Like you said, a near mirror match, he needs to take damage anywhere he can, and he gets one more shot in on that tower. Still 800 HP separate. And this will be a nice little counter push for Mo. He does have a slight elixir advantage now with that Golden Knight on the board. And the giant skeleton in front. Let's see how Vitor builds this defense. And Cannon Cart plays in a great spot. That way it can help with other units on the board. Will not get in range of that giant skeleton bomb, even if it survives the first giant skelly. Perfect tile placement there by Mohammed Light. Giant Skelly, Golden Knight, Electro Wizard. That's what that card's called. And that ghost does not turn to the tower quite yet. Golden, or the Giant Skeleton to pick up. That ghost was nearly a serious problem. And the problem. lineup, oh, what a nice NATO from Vitor to prevent what could have been a lot of damage. 1301 for Mo, 1829 for Vitor in this one lane game. I hear a pin drop in this room right now as we go into Triple Elixir. Everyone riveted, focused on can Vitor do it? Can he win a mirror match against the best of all time? And a big pile up here, and another connection, I think. No, it goes to the cannon instead. Just hanging on right now, Drill. So far, the Drills have gotten more damage for Vitor than they have from Mo. This cannon cart on its wheels will go down from that giant skelly bomb. Two giant skeletons on the board, plus a ghost getting ready for what might be the final play of the match. And look at this traffic jam in that left-hand lane. The Magic Archer going off to no man's land and still trying to get the chain, but Mo Muhammad Light cannot get it. 1481 to 1135. Magic Archer staying on the board. That's a lot on the of. board. Drill in one direction. Ghost not available. E is to work. The ghost gets the on ghost, the tower. And it's getting taken. It's getting taken. The, the, the giant skeleton. The giant skeleton. The giant skeleton.
very end. That is the only way to chalk it up. He went in that house at night and robbed Vitor of game number one. And now you know the confidence for Mo is through the roof. I think I just saw him give some eyebrows at, uh, at his buddies in the crowd there. That was one of those ones where I think that even Mo knows he got away with one. Absolutely. He was pushing that lane. The pileup was coming in. And I almost think I oversold the pileup because that giant skeleton bomb came down. But still, Mo says, no, no, no. I'm going in. Let's look at the replay. Oh, my word. Look at the smile on Mo's face right now. A little sly. No man's and land. check this and out. So you see two giant skeletons down. The NATO pulls all that back. The the Golden Knight does not take the Magic Archer off, and this just kind of clears the path. Yeah. Now look at that. The Royal Ghost gets knocked forward a little bit. And Drill goes the tank, for. and there you go. The Drill tanking, the NATO to hold all that back. That gets the Giant Skeleton Bomb in place. And yeah, look at the look on Mo's face. He's like, uh, okay. <laughs> sure, I meant to do that. That was supposed to happen. Yeah. And Mohammed Light picking up game number one, a definite come from behind victory. Vitor was controlling that the entire time, but that's what that deck does. You make one mistake, Giant Skeleton gets too close, or the Drill gets a ton of value, and then you still have to worry about that Magic Archer. That's the thing about that deck, and I think why it's so popular, right? You have the Magic Archer, you have the Giant Skeleton, you have the Drill, you have the Golden Knight, and those NATO combinations. There are so many ways to steal a game. I mean, that's why I play, is because you have like five win <laughs> conditions in one deck. You're still in the game until the final moments, and maybe the most shocking prediction of our entire tournament, because I don't think I ever expected Mohammed Light to be an under Dog, unless it was in our grand finals against maybe Moogie, maybe Morton. And yeah, 48% for Muhammad Light, 52% for Vitor. So look, Vitor has been playing great this whole he way has. through. Maybe people are thinking that Muhammad Light is shook, but right now it's Muhammad Light with the game advantage here. Yeah, he's doing the shaking, absolutely. And hopping into game number two, Vitor's life on the line against the Prince of Egypt. Let's go. Couple number one badges there for Mo. What did he win? Everything. Oh, okay. <laughs> so Vitor may be showing a bit heavier, which is always an interesting tactic against some of the best players in the world. That well, I was gonna say, Vitor just played his, his ace deck in game number one. Drill Nato is, is his go-to, and he lost the mirror match there at the end. So very curious about Vitor's choice here in game number two. Yeah, that's a really solid point that you make. And, and when you lose with your comfort against a mirror match, I mean, it's it's frustrating, but also mirror matches, you talk to a lot of people, they hate them. Even yeah. if it's their comfort deck, I don't think it means the same as losing with your comfort deck against, you know, whatever other deck is out there. Mirror matches can always be difficult. And Mo came out on top in game one. Vitor looking like he could be running RG here in game number two. Yeah, it does have a lot of RG feel to it, especially with that Dark Prince. I was going to say, Mortar Miner AQ is his other go-to. And if Vitor was playing that, you have to imagine that Mo and his team are ready for it. 100% here, Knight coming down the lane. We haven't seen a whole lot of Knight, although I'm sure that will change very, very soon with the Whispers of a Balance update and a Knight buff coming in. Little log to clear, doesn't do the job. Hog and he Rider. pushes the AQ wow. to the tower, and that's just one of those beautiful plays. Hog still gets a hit, and Mohammed Light strikes early. King Tower activation here, but at this stage, now that you've got that first 12, 1300 HP down, not as impactful. At this point, King Tower, when activated, takes an uncontested hog from seven shots down to four. So it'll cut the hog shots down by about half, but as you many know, if you're watching this right now, when we get down to the back end of this match, it's gonna be less about hog, more about spells. That is perfectly chalked up by my good friend, Rich Slayton here. We've been doing this a little while, and I believe that's exactly the plan for Mo. Keep the pressure up so that Vitor cannot build massive pushes. Make sure he can't put all his elixir in one lane and then spell cycle his way out of this game with that massive 1300 HP lead. Pretty even on Elixir right now, although a nice prediction, E-Spirit. 
out of Vitor, picked up and saved by the Knight. Hog to the opposite lane, and did he get the timing right? And that's brilliant timing. Does it stop the Hog entirely? Oh! No. The timing on that Fisherman pull for the Hog with activated King Tower is so hard. Yet to be five tiles off away from the river, and yet to almost <laughs> predict the Hog Rider to prevent any shots. The reactive one doesn't get it done. And the most difficult thing is because of that lead, Mohammed is never forced to play a Hog Rider at any given moment. He only has to slide them in when Vitor leaves the door open. And that's any time you see right there. He does actually predict with the Hunter. That is a great play by Vitor, but the Knight distracts it. There's no Fisherman, 12-14 now. Turns the opposite way. Hunter gonna work here against the Knight. Fisherman to pull, Bomb Tower trying to control this and nice little pre-log there for the Skelly. Yeah. Should get one shot from the Royal Giant, and it does. And I love what Vitor is doing here because this is the only way for him to win this game. He has to keep making these massive swings with big predictions, but the problem is he's going against Mohammed Light. Mo sees one time that he gets predicted and he changes up his gameplay. And look at that, going to the middle instead of going to the outside here. Does not get the hit, but the EQ, that's where the damage is now. AQ's out in both directions now. A Fire Spirit to distract one. A Log gonna come in and push it back. And Muhammad Light will get another shot unless the unit comes down. A Dark Prince spent early. No shield on that Dark Prince. Knight picks it up, gets it off the board fairly quickly. And now again, keep in mind that Vitor needs Fisherman to support these Royal Giant pushes, but Fisherman is also the only, like, really, really great positive counter he has to that Hog Rider. So now he has to counter Hog Rider with either the Archer Queen or the Hunter Plus. And I was just gonna say, I would be shocked if Mo went in with the Hog right then and there. I think, yes, exactly. Spell Cycle, I, maybe a Log could have came down a little earlier, and then the Hunter comes down uh, to catch this Hog Rider that goes in and almost gets another shot. Mo's playing a great game now, and there's the Hog. Fisherman's not there in time. The prediction of the Skellies, wow. the distraction, the misplay. Wow. All of it comes Beautiful. crashing down, and Mohammed Light continues to burn through this lower bracket. And that's what he's done before. You know, I talked to him after he lost that first match, and he said, I've been to the lower bracket before, yep. I'm fine. Yep, and you see right there, Mama Light could not be happier with her son after he has played an immaculate three sets after the first drop. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, this is what you want to see. I'm so excited. Josh, down there with Mohammed Light, what does he have to say? Three 2-0 sets in a row. We have the three big M's as well, Morton, Mookie, and Mo. How excited are you right now? How do you feel? Do you think you have it? You know, you, you have what it takes to win it all. Well, right now, I think I've already surpassed the stage fear, you know? Like, I think uh, I already have the experience needed, and I'm very, very confident in myself going forward, and uh, I'm gonna give it all to maybe try to win, you know, as always, from the loser's bracket. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> no more stage fear, no problems for Mo, for a Mo now! Back to the casters. Thanks a lot, Josh. Mo totally dialed in now. And of course, as you've said a bunch, he's been here before. Vitor, a valiant effort, but Juicy, when Mo is dialed in, it's so difficult to beat him. It was so fascinating to watch that last game. His micro was on point, whether it be distracting that fisherman at the end or even pulling, using that new Dark Prince mechanic of jumping over the river, pulling that to the side with the Fire Spirit to keep his Arch Queen healthy. It was really just a work of art. And one thing to point out here, and again, lots of different levels of players watching this match, uh, and we'll go through the decks here as we talk about this. Lots of different levels of players watching this gameplay. And let's first talk about this mirror match. We'll talk about this in a moment. This mirror match, fascinating. That is Vitor best deck and Mo again stole this one at the end he absolutely did I was talking to AC a lot about this matchup behind the scenes and really the cannon card was a get out of jail free card for Mo in this match not only is it a mirror matchup but he has that cannon card and it was constantly staying up on the map for a very long time providing insane amounts of value and that's what allowed him to make that monster push an absolute monster push on to game number two and this is the master class i want to talk about this the skeleton work from mohammed light we saw the same thing from moogie earlier with that king tower activation a lot of newer players kind of avoid the skeletons they're small they're one elixir but they're a technical card and we saw just how valuable they can be for those newer players to learn about. The One Elixir cards in this match were absolutely beautifully placed, like I said, whether it be distracting the fishermen when you're playing on defense to prevent your knight getting pulled or the hog getting pulled or just 
just kiting around that Dark Prince, it was just beautiful. Absolutely beautiful gameplay from Muhammad Light. And of course, you're watching all at home making your own predictions. We've made our predictions here at the desk. Let's see how the casting squad came out at the end. Sweet with a bit of a bagel there on the front end. I mean, Juicy, I see Sweet right there. Juicy uh, was dominating yesterday, struggling today. It's looking like out of all of us that it might be Joshua A.C. Sharon with the best predictions on the day. Yeah, I definitely struggled today. There was a, quite a few upsets. I'm very proud of Josh. That was some very nice picks from his end. And, you know, I do think there's one wrong there. I picked Morton in the top. Morton I was the Morton winner too. there in match 15. All right, I get a buff there, and you no, know, Josh was wrong on that one. All right. <laughs> All right, hey, give me my credit where credit's due. I got did better than Josh on that prediction. Well, either way, it was a whole lot of fun today, and, of course, we still have more action tomorrow. Let's look at the bracket, check in, and see where we went today. And, of course, tomorrow, Juicy, we have two big matches in the upper semifinals, Sandbox versus Samuel and Morton versus Air Surfer. Those are two huge matchups. Sandbox versus Samuel. Main thing there is Sandbox. I totally forgot what I was going to say. More <laughs> versus Air Surfer. That's going to be a fascinating match. I want to see Air Surfer win, but I think Morton's going to. And then we go down into the lower bracket where a lot of the action is taking place tomorrow. We do have our final six players. Everything gets serious, and this is the most important thing of that lower bracket. No matter what. Moogie and Mohamed Light cannot both be in our grand final. And if they will both face very difficult opponents in this lower bracket as well. So at best for Moogie and Mohamed Light, you want to see that rematch? They both have to win in that round four lower bracket matchup, but only one of them could potentially go on to be our champion. That is actually crazy to think that that player or those players, which could be the winner's bracket final, is going to be having in the loser's bracket. We'll see who they're going to be playing against. That's going to be crazy. Let's take a look at the action from this last one from the day. It was a great day overall. Let's take it in. Ooh, boy. Get your heart ready. This is the moment we rise. This is the moment we rise. What an incredible end to our day two. And I think the biggest thing that stands out from today is our top three seeds in Moogie, Mo, and Morton did exactly what they thought we, we thought they would do. I'm so excited, I can hardly talk. AC, what are your thoughts on today? Mo, Moogie, Morton, Mo, Moogie, Morton, Mo, Moogie, Morton. Mo, obviously so happy for his mom, so happy for everything. Moogie, we saw predictions after predictions. Morton, I have nothing to say. He, ca he, he caught up to me like throughout the day, and he's like, oh, you didn't vote for me. Why? So I'm not going to say anything nice. And the craziest thing is to get out of that lower bracket, as Rich just said, Moogie or Mo will not make it. They will most likely face each other. We'll have to see tomorrow. Juicy, this was a wild day. We saw some crazy close finishes. What was your favorite moment of the day? My favorite moment of the day was watching Muhammad Light's last game. The micro was perfect. It was like watching an artist at work. I've never seen gameplay like that. We have our top six, our final, the best players in the world. The reason everybody flew here to Helsinki, Finland, on behalf of the whole squad here. Jackson Juicy J. Wall, Andrew Guy, Joshua AC Sharon, I'm Rich Slayton. We'll see you back here tomorrow where we crown our Clash Royale League 2022 World Champion. This is the moment we rise. This is the moment we rise. We are the best of the best. We will not back down our rest. So we drink from the cup of the wet out of hay. Crash tonight. Crash tonight. Look into the sky. 